Test, test, test. Today is a committee on housing and buildings. Today's date is December 13, 2018. This was recorded by Sakeem Bradley. Testing, testing one, two, three, testing for master control and Vitech, closed caption.
Testing, testing, testing for Vitek. Double check, testing for Vitek. Close caption. Testing, 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 one, two, three, for closed caption. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Carnegie, Jr., Chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm joined today by fellow committee member Fernando Cabrera, 
Uh, and today we'll hear testimony from the various city agencies charged with enforcing laws that protect tenants, as well as members of the real estate industry, tenant advocates, and other interested members of the public regarding tenant displacement and our ongoing affordable housing cri crisis. We'll also hear testimony regarding a package of 18 bills aimed at preventing tenant displacement by punishing predatory landlords, addressing the housing court eviction machine, and ensuring that the administration does its part to prevent the harassment and mistreatment that forces tenants out of their homes. In New York City, we're working tirelessly to address our ongoing housing crisis by pursuing every avenue to create and maintain affordable housing. However, as detailed in an eye-opening series published by the New York Times in May of this year, many building own owners are working directly against these efforts, frequently using immoral and aggressive methods to raise rents and remove tenants entirely. These methods range from lying about making housing improvements for higher rents to crafting an equitable buyout offers for unwitting tenants or harassing tenants with actions that threaten their health and safety. For example, at 25 Grove Street, a new owner began gutting apartments without permits. One tenant told the Times that a saw came directly through their floor. Eventually, so much dust had erupted within the building that tenants were forced to wear masks in their homes. Shockingly, the resulting dust violation was eventually dismissed. 632 Sterling Place, where a new owner used a buyout offer to convince a tenant to move out, then never paid her. This owner proceeded to gut the building with tenants inside, turning off the heat and removing an entire staircase. Eventually, remaining tenants moved to a hotel with the city's help and taxpayer dollars. One family stayed at this hotel for over a year until the city tried to move them to a homeless shelter, at which point they were able to find an apartment that unfortunately cost three times their previously regulated rent. 600 Lincoln Place, where a new owner raised the rent to the point of de deregulating units, claiming that over $40,000 of building improvements justified the drastic increase. However, the Times reported that the proof of these improvements was riddled with errors. For example, the owner claimed to have redone the closets in one unit, but the apartment in question had no closets. To make matters worse, predatory landlords have two key advantages in their fight against affordable housing. First, they have the advantage of working within a system that assists them in their efforts. New York City's housing court system, which was created to protect tenants from dangerous conditions, has devolved into a deeply flawed structure that favors the interest and savvy of certain building owners and their attorneys, when, who often rely on a tenant's lack of counsel and information. While the, council, while the council passed our landmark right to council legislation in August of 2017, the New York Times reported earlier this year that process servers are not serving these tenants. Some tenants did not even know that they had been evicted until the marshals showed up at their door. How can tenants use our right to council resources when they do not even know that they're being taken to court? We need to ensure that tenants facing housing court proceedings have an opportunity to defend themselves. Predatory landlords have the additional advantage of working within a city that often sadly provides inadequate oversight. The administration must do more to ensure that vulnerable tenants are protected. Last session, the council made great strides in addressing these forms of tenant harassment by passing the Stand for Tenant Safety Package, expanding the definition of harassment and requiring a certificate of no harassment as a condition of obtaining a permit. The bills in this package seek to plug up enforcement holes by addressing the methods that the worst building owners undertake to effectively evict tenants and providing the Department of Buildings with tools to enforce existing laws and protect tenants who are subject to dangerous construction conditions. Thank you to the administration for being here to testify on these bills and thank you to the housing advocates in attendance. While the city is doing all it can to protect affordable housing in the city, the state needs to take action on this issue. Earlier this year, we passed resolutions 326, 328, 331, 332, and 339, which call upon our colleagues in Albany to pass legislation that would limit the ability of landlords to increase the rents of rent-regulated units. We also passed resolution number 327, which calls on the state legislature to extend the statute of limitations for rent overcharges, and resolution number 325, which calls on the state legislature to repeal the laws that limit the ability of the city to regulate our own residential rents. Finally, we passed resolution number 340, which calls on the state legislature to, pa legislature to pass legislation that would extend rates rent stabilization to unregulated apartments. We're hopeful that these efforts, in conjunction with the bills that we're hearing today, work to dismantle predatory practices and protect the city's affordable housing. 
With that, I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify that today that please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for all public testimony. And now we'll have the administration affirm their testimony. We're going to swear. Raise your right hands, please. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Great. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of both uh, Raphael Aspinall and Carlina Rivera. Oh, and Mark Levine. Uh, before you begin your testimony, um, we receive cards from the administration, but it doesn't have everyone, so if you could just identify yourself for the record uh, prior to your testimony, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Rick Chandler, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined by Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs, and the Department's Buildings Marshal, Salvatore Agostino, as well as my colleagues from HPD. We're pleased to update this committee on the work that the Department has been doing to protect tenants in buildings under construction and to offer testimony on 12 of the bills before the committee today. Before I begin, I would like to thank the City Council and the tenant advocacy community, including the Stand for Tenant Safety Coalition, for their partnership in this important work. The use of construction to harass tenants is an absolutely dreadful practice and the department takes seriously its obligation to work with our partners in government to hold recalcitrant landlords accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Thanks in part to the work of the city council and the tenant advocacy community, we've made significant strides in protecting tenants and holding landlords accountable. And with your continued support, additional progress will be made to effectively combat the problem. The department values its participation in the Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, a partnership of city and state agencies which was created to investigate and bring enforcement actions against landlords who harass tenants by creating unsafe living conditions. Separately, the department partners with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to perform inspections. Over the last two years, both on its own and with the task force, the department has performed 2,300 inspections and issued more than 1,600 summonses. Additionally, the department revokes or suspends the licenses or filing privileges of construction professionals who use construction to harass tenants. Finally, the department continues to work with its prosecutorial partners, including the state attorney general and district attorney's offices to bring criminal and civil actions against landlords for endangering and harassing tenants. Resulting from the department's investigations, cases involving several owners have been referred to the state attorney general's office and are in various stages of prosecution. These investigations have resulted in unprecedented penalties for bad actor landlords, including jail time. In addition to its participation in the task force, the department is hard at work implementing and enforcing a dozen laws enacted in 2017, which are intended to combat this very issue. Over the past year, the department has prioritized its inspection of work without a permit complaints in multiple dwellings. Those complaints deemed immediately hazardous receive an inspection within 12 hours, and all others receive an inspection within 10 days. Required, we've required more detailed tenant protection plans, made them available on our website, and, requiring, and required posting notice of their availability within buildings. We've performed proactive inspections of work requiring a tenant protection plan, performed more frequent audits of professional certified work, professionally certified work in occupied multiple dwellings, and further reduced the ability of bad actor landlords to professionally certify their work applied greater scrutiny of contractors who perform work without a permit and performed proactive inspections of their work. We've ensured that the Safe Construction Bill of Rights is posted within buildings so tenants are aware of the work occurring in their building and how it might impact them. We've launched the Office of the Tenant Advocate, which serves as a resource to help tenants understand the laws that govern construction and to investigate complaints of construction as harassment. The OTA accomplishes this through monitoring compliance with tenant protection plans and facilitating inspections of complaints concerning construction as harassment. The OTA also works closely with the department's buildings marshal to coordinate inspections, enforce tenant protection plans, penalize predatory landlords, and make referrals to criminal law enforcement. While these laws have significantly improved protection for tenants, the department believes that more can be done to ensure no tenants, including those in rent regulated units, slip through the cracks. The department is integrating data it receives from New York State Homes and Community Renewal, 
regarding the rent regulation status of buildings into its systems. Owners of buildings that can contain occupied dwelling units subject to rent regulation will no longer be allowed to proceed with an application for construction document approval to the department if the information they submit is not consistent with the HCR data the department has on file. This measure will prevent owners of rent regulated buildings from getting construction permits if they submit false statements to the department regarding either the rent regulation or occupancy status of their buildings. I'd like to turn now to the bills before the committee today, starting with the three that relate to tenant protection plans, or TPPs. The department is largely supportive of intro 1107, which would shift the burden of creating and submitting a TPP to the department from owners to contractors. Given that contractors are performing the work, they are in a far better position than owners to determine the means and methods for protecting tenants from construction. The department believes more can be done to ensure compliance with TPPs and suggests amending this bill to allow to also require that TPP be subject to frequent inspections by department approved third party inspectors. These inspections could occur throughout the duration of construction work and would be in addition to the proactive and complaint based inspections the department already performs. This bill and the amendments we are proposing will further improve TPP quality and compliance. Intro 1278 would require that the department ensure that specific components of TPPs meet certain standards in the construction codes. Additionally, the bill requires that the department perform inspections of 20% of sites with TPPs within seven days after the commencement of work and perform additional inspections every 120 days until work for which the TPP is required is completed and within 72 hours of receipt of a complaint concerning such work. The department is supportive of the provisions in this bill that call for greater scrutiny of TPPs. As for the additional inspections required by this bill, as an alternative, the department supports the inspections we are suggesting as amendments to intro 1107, which would be in excess of those required under this bill. Intro 1280 would require that TPPs identify the total number of units in a building and the total number of occupied units in such buildings. This bill also increases the penalties for a false filing related to a new building alteration or full demolition permit or for failure to file a TPP where such TPP is required to a minimum of $10,000 for a first offense and a minimum of $25,000 for a subsequent offense. The department is supportive of including the total number of units in a building and the total number of occupied units in such buildings on TPPs as this would increase the information available to tenants. The department also supports increasing penalties for failure to file a TPP. However, given that false filings can include what amount to clerical errors, the department does not support increasing penalties for all incorrect information on a construction document, particularly if it is an isolated incident rather than a pattern of deception. The next four bills relate to false statements on applications and construction documents submitted to the department. Intro 1171 would require that the department conduct an audit of building owner's portfolio to determine if any additional false statements have been made when it discovers that such owner has made a false statement to the department on a construction application. The department would also be required to notify other agencies, including the Department of Investigation and HCR, when it discovers a false statement. This bill would also require that the department audit applications submitted by owners, building owners who file for more than five post-approval amendments, and that finally the department audit 25% of buildings on HPD's speculation watch list. The department is largely supportive of this bill. Currently, when the department discovers that a false statement has been made with respect to the rent regulation status of a building, the department already reviews the building owner's portfolio to determine if any additional false statements have been made with respect to other buildings in such owner's portfolio. Furthermore, as discussed previously, the department's efforts to integrate HCR data into its systems will prevent owners of rent regulated buildings from getting construction permits if they submit false statements to the department regarding either the rent regulation or occupancy status of their buildings. The department is certainly supportive of sharing information with its partner agencies where it discovers a false statement related to the rent regulation status of a building and already does so regularly. Regarding PAAs, Changes are common as a job progresses. 
The PAA process allows applicants to make minor changes or to correct errors in applications or construction documents submitted to the department, which in turn allows the department to maintain accurate records of construction jobs and ensure compliance. As such, the department does not believe that PAAs are an appropriate indicator of harassment and does not want to discourage applicants from filing PAAs when necessary. Finally, the department supports auditing buildings included on HPD's speculation watch list to determine if any false statements have been made with respect to applications for construction submitted for such buildings. Intro 1275 would require that depart the department deny permits for a building for one year when it discovers that a false statement regarding the occupancy status of the building has been made to the department or where a work without a permit violation is issued to such building. The department requires permit applicants to identify both the number of dwelling units in a building and the number of occupied dwelling units in a building. This information is then populated on building permits. The number of occupied dwelling units may change over time as new tenants move into the building or existing tenants move out which makes verifying the number of occupied dwelling units very challenging. Furthermore, as discussed previously, the department's efforts to integrate HCR data into its systems will prevent owners of rent-regulated buildings from getting construction permits if they submit false statements to the department regarding either the rent regulation or occupancy status of their buildings. For these reasons, the department is not supportive of the bill's provision related to false statement as it relates to occupancy status. Additionally, the department does not support denying permits for buildings that have previously received a work without a permit violation. Such an approach effectively prevents bad actors from coming into compliance and makes continued noncompliance the only path available to them. Absent the department's scrutiny, this work can put tenants and the public in harm's way. To be clear, we are not suggesting that bad actors who perform unpermitted work do not deserve to be punished. We can and do hold these bad actors accountable. Our concern with this bill is that it may worsen the problem it seeks to solve. Intro 1277 would require that the department perform inspections before approving an application for construction documents where such application indicates that the building that is the subject of such application is unoccupied. The stated purpose of this inspection is to ascertain the occupancy status of such buildings. While the department recognizes the importance of ascertaining the occupancy status of a building, we're not supportive of this bill given that its approach would add questionable value and strain the department's limited resources. An application for construction document approval does not guarantee that the department will approve such application, and what's more, and, and what's more the issuance of a permit does not guarantee that the property owner will actually conduct any work. Accordingly, many of the proposed inspections will add no value for the tenants. Furthermore, as discussed previously, the department's efforts to integrate HCR data into its systems will prevent owners of rent-regulated buildings from getting construction permits if they submit false statements to the department regarding either their rent regulation or occupancy status of their buildings. Intro 1279 would require that the department audit 20% of certificates of correction of immediately hazardous violations filed with the department. Such audit must include an inspection by the department to ensure that the condition subject to the certificate of correction has been corrected. The department takes very seriously conditions that result in the issuance of immediately hazardous violations, and such conditions are reinspected every 60 days unless a certificate of correction is submitted to the department. Building owners typically have 40 days to correct a condition that resulted in a violation being issued. The department received approximately 19,000 certificates of correction for immediately hazardous violations last year. As a matter of practice, the department already audits the certificate of correction that are submitted and is therefore supportive of the intent of this bill. The next five bills focus on bad actors. Intro 975 would require that the department deny permits where a building has multiple housing maintenance code or construction code violations. The department would be required to make the determination that a building with fewer than 35 units has three or more violations per unit and that a building with greater than 35 units has two or more violations per unit. With some exceptions, the department supports denying permits to bad actors and is doing so in a way that it believes is more effective than the proposal offered in this bill. Local Law 160 of 2017 requires the department to deny or revoke permits for owners who have accumulated more than $25,000 in debt to the city. 
The Department believes this is a better approach than what is provided for in this bill and that it prevents bad actor landlords from pulling permits but makes exceptions for affordable housing projects, permits for the purposes of correcting outstanding violations, and for units owned as cooperatives or condominiums. Intro 977 would require that the Department sanction registered design professionals where such professionals have submitted two professionally certified applications for construction document approval to the Department that contain errors that resulted in a stop work order. Additionally, Intro 1241 would require that the Department sanction all other registered design professionals working for a firm where one of such firms registered design professionals is sanctioned by the City. Additionally, the Department would be required to report this information to the City Council on an annual basis. The Department already sanctions registered design professionals who have submitted two professionally certified applications for construction document approval to the Department that contain errors that result in the revocation of an associated permit. The Department is supportive of Intro 977 as it would reinforce the Department's existing authority and practice. While the, Department while the Department appreciates the intent of Intro 1241, which is to prevent registered design professionals who have been sanctioned by the Department from continuing to do business with the Department, the Department would like to discuss this bill further given that it may not always be appropriate to impute the sanctions imposed on a registered design professional to other registered design professionals employed by the same firm. Further, imputing sanctions to other registered design professionals employed by the same firm presents due process concerns for the Department. The Department takes its obligations to address bad actors seriously and is aggressive in utilizing existing tools to ensure that those who are found to have engaged in actions that violate the law are held accountable. Intro 1247 would require the Department to provide copies of summonses to all tenants living in the building to which such summonses have been issued. This bill also requires the Department to provide such tenants with information about the adjudication process. The Department issues over 150,000 summonses a year. While the Department supports the goal of sharing this information with tenants, providing a copy of such summonses to each tenant living in the building at which such summons have been issued is not practical given that we have limited resources that would be far better directed toward investigating problems in buildings or on construction sites. Further, information pertaining to a summons issued by the Department is already available on the Department's website. Tenants are already able to see information pertaining to the violation issued, including any applicable ECB hearing dates and times. Therefore, the Department does not support this bill as drafted, but looks forward to discussing other ways to increase awareness around summonses to tenants, like requiring that such summonses be posted within a building until they are resolved. Intro 1257 would require the Department to issue a stop work order where a permit holder refuses to grant the Department access to the property for which a permit has been issued for the purposes of conducting an inspection. While the Department understands the intent of Intro 1257, it does not support this bill as it is unnecessary. The Department already has the authority to address the concern this bill is intended to address and utilizes such authority as appropriate. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify before you today, and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cornegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Maria Torres Springer. I'm the Commissioner of the Department, New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and I'm here today to testify in intros 1279, 1274, 59, 551, 1242, and 30. I'm also joined here today by Anne Marie Santiago, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. We know that every day, New Yorkers continue to feel the strain of extraordinary market pressures. Some have the added pressure of bad landlords who illegally de deny essential services, create unsafe or intolerable living conditions, or otherwise try to force them to leave their buildings or surrender their rights. The de Blasio administration has made protecting tenants a core part of its strategy to confront the affordable housing crisis. These bad actors may use multiple angles to exploit the system, and for that reason, the administration has worked in partnership with the City Council and partners at various branches of government to tackle the issue with a comprehensive, multi-pronged approach. 
As a city, we are focused on keeping people in their homes and neighborhoods by closing loopholes in rent regulation laws at the state level, creating and preserving historic numbers of affordable homes through a variety of tools, empowering tenants with more resources, aggressively enforcing city codes, and utilizing all of our partnerships to create data-driven, innovative tools targeted at stopping harassment before it starts. The Council, of course, has been an invaluable partner in every step of this work. We thank everyone, um, the Housing and Buildings Committee, and also Speaker Johnson for his continued leadership on this issue. HPD is in the business of protecting tenants. And our work is a critical piece of this aggressive approach to combating tenant harassment. I'd like to take a few minutes to speak to each of these efforts further. First, strengthening the state's rent regulation laws. Core to this effort, of course, is strengthening the state laws and rent regulation. As rent regulation comes up for renewal in Albany next year, the de Blasio administration will fight for vital reforms to retain the stock of rent regulated apartments, ensure current tenants are secure in their homes, and protect the benefits of rent regulation for future tenants. These reforms include, one, ending high rent vacancy decontrol, the city is calling for the elimination of vacancy decontrol. Currently, a vacant apartment with a rent of $2,733 per month may be deregulated and gives bad landlords a target to aim for when considering how to game the system. Two, ending the vacancy allowance. The city is calling for the elimination of the 20% increase in monthly rent when tenants vacate an apartment. This allowance has created strong incentives for bad actors to pressure tenants out of their homes in the hopes of faster rising rents. Three, limiting individual apartment improvement and major capital improvement increases. The city is calling for reforms on how landlords can use permanent rent increases for building-wide or individual apartments. These increases are used as a mechanism to drive up legal rents to reach the threshold for rent deregulation. Reforming our state's rent laws is vital for New York City residents to continue to exercise their choice to stay in neighborhoods they call home. We know that the City Council shares the same goal, and we look forward to working together to fight for all New Yorkers in 2019, the quote-unquote year of the tenant. For us, however, every year is the year of the tenant. We are always thinking about the needs of both today and for the future. For that reason, HPD will need adept nimbleness to respond to the bad actors who may try to exploit the new laws that come out of Albany in 2019. It will be critical to ensure that the rent reg laws in Albany fulfill the goals that we laid out, which include constant assessment of any unintended consequences that may arise. We must be both responsive and proactive to the changing facets of tenant harassment. Next, creating and preserving existing affordable housing. Keeping New York affordable is an important part of the goal to give tenants the choice to stay in their homes. I'm pleased to say that last fiscal year, HPD financed the development and preservation of more than 32,000 affordable homes. And in the last fiscal year, breaking an all-time record previously set in 1989. In total, the administration has financed over 109,000 affordable apartments under Housing New York. We achieve these overall numbers while exceeding our commitment to providing housing for the lowest income New Yorkers, something that we know is a priority for the City Council as well. In 2017, the Mayor committed to historic investment over the remainder of the Housing New York plan to ensure that 25% of our production is for extremely low income and very low income New Yorkers. To date, we have exceeded even this revised commitment. Last year, for instance, 57% of the housing we created or preserved served individuals making less than 37,000 per year or 47 for a family of three. To date, 40% of all of the housing we have created or preserved is for extremely low and very low income New Yorkers. And 85% of the entire plan serves low income residents. The cornerstone of the mayor's housing plan continues to be the preservation of affordability in existing buildings, many of which are in need of physical and financial assistance or are facing expiring protections. Last, last year, the city used a, a wide array of programs and tools to extend affordability and finance needed improvements in nearly 23,000 homes. 
To date, more than 76,000 homes have been preserved through Housing New York, securing greater affordability for tenants and financing building-wide and apartment-level repairs to ensure the long-term quality of that housing. The city also utilizes voucher programs distributed at all levels of government and the NYC rent freeze program and rent regulated units, which include SCREE and DRE whenever possible. These are important benefits so that our most vulnerable New Yorkers can stay in their homes in the city that they love without the fear of being displaced by escalating rents. The next strategy, empowering tenants with more resources. The city does extensive outreach and education to ensure tenants, especially those in rent regulated units, understand their rights and their responsibilities. The Mayor's Tenant Support Unit, or TSU, um, these are specialists from the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit who are on the ground citywide, conducting proactive outreach to tenants to inform them of their rights, identifying housing-related issues, document building conditions, and connecting tenants to free services, like legal assistance, in order to mitigate displacement, landlord harassment, and facilitate home-related repairs. Since its creation in 2015, um, and through November of 2018, TSU's specialists, who collectively speak over 12 languages, have done outreach to over 365,000 tenants across New York City. The council and the administration, of course, have also taken unprecedented steps in recent years to better even the playing field for tenants. The Universal Access to Council team, also part of the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, conducts proactive outreach to tenants with cases in housing court to connect them to free legal assistance through HRA's Office of Civil Justice. Since beginning outreach in 2018, through November, um, through November 2018, um, this office has made over 45,000 outreach attempts to tenants in 15 zip codes where the program is currently active. And there, this is bearing fruit, all of this effort. Since 2013, there has been a 27% drop in evictions. Today, 30% of tenants who appear in eviction cases in housing court are represented by counsel, compared only to 1% in 2013. HPD also holds events and resource fairs, distributes essential tenant guides, such as the ABCs of Housing Widely, and now, due to the support um, of many elected officials, has a mobile van that travels throughout the city, providing information and services directly to tenants in their communities. Every summer, we also partner with the City Council on a program called HPD in your district, where representatives from our Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services spend a day in council members' district offices providing one-on-one -on -one education and assistance to tenants and owners. And we're certainly looking forward to continuing that program um, in the summers to come. Next, enforcing the city's codes. In addition to the efforts um, DOB spoke of in the earlier testimony, HPD aggressively enforces the city's housing maintenance code by responding to complaints, conducting inspections, and issuing violations with a variety of partners. In fiscal year 18, for instance, we attempted more than 700,000 inspections and issued more than 522,000 violations. We also utilize a variety of targeted programs so that we can direct our resources to our most problematic buildings. For example, through the Alternative Enforcement Program, or AEP, we work with severely distressed multiple dwellings to provide additional support aimed at addressing violations and qualifying conditions for health and the safety of tenants. Our underlying conditions program allows HPD to issue an administrative order to correct the underlying conditions that have caused or are causing a violation of the housing maintenance code. And when landlords do not address the most hazardous violations, we step in and do the work ourselves to protect tenants. In fiscal year 18, we spent approximately $10 million in construction and utility costs to conduct repairs or provide services in thousands of buildings. This includes installing window guards, replacing boilers, addressing lead paints, hazards, and our other work to address qualifying immediately hazardous violations not being done in the required time frames or manner. Our housing litigation division also brings cases in housing court against owners 
who do not correct outstanding violations and, when necessary, seeks findings of contempt and jail against recalcitrant landlords. HPD initi initiated over 7,000 housing court cases and collected approximately 7 million in settlements and judgments in fiscal year 2018. We also work with the Attorney General's Office, the state's Tenant Protection Unit, and of course, the city's Department of Buildings in the Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, which investigates potential harassment and brings enforcement actions, including two indictments for criminal charges against landlords who do not provide safe and habitable living conditions for tenants. Next, working together to create new innovative tools. As I said earlier, with any new regulation, there will always be, unfortunately, bad actors looking to exploit loopholes in that regulation. Therefore, innovation and nimbleness are necessary in both responding to the needs of tenants today and, importantly, building the capacity across agencies to respond to the new ways that certain landlords might exploit the system as the rent regulation landscape changes. That is why this administration has recently created even more tools to increase our proactive approach so that we can stop harassment before it starts. HPD is proud to have recently announced, for instance, the creation of the city's anti-tenant harassment unit, which will have 10 dedicated staff members, including two attorneys, to initiate litigation against unscrupulous owners and landlords. In fact, for the first time through this unit, HPD will be able to bring claims of harassment to housing court based on building conditions supported by violations in addition to HPD-initiated cases. The new unit will use data analysis to ident identify potential buildings and portfolios where harassment is occurring, respond to emergency complaints, partner closely with the Department of Buildings and other agencies to address issues in buildings where maintenance and harassment has been identified, and connect tenants with legal services. The new unit will enable HPD to increase the number of buildings with potential construction or maintenance harassment that HPD can inspect from about 200 buildings annually to approximately 1,500 buildings. We are also rolling out a new program called Partners in Preservation so that we can develop comprehensive anti-displacement strategies in changing neighborhoods. HPD will pair available data with the on-the-ground experience and expertise of community-based organizations to tailor strategies, including tools to address harassment and disrepair, anti-eviction legal services, homeowner assistance, and many others in neighborhoods identified as most at risk of losing affordability. The City Council has, of course, been an essential partner in combating the ever-changing issue of tenant harassment, and we appreciate that we are getting to a better place on an issue where, fundamentally, we really do believe we share the same goals. For example, HPD recently expanded the Certification of No Harassment Program and launched the Speculation Watch List, both of which were developed in very close partnership with the City Council. These data-driven tools work to identify buildings where there is the greatest risk for harassment and speculative behavior in order to protect tenants. Previously, we worked together to strengthen the position of tenants in housing court by expanding the definition of tenant harassment to include such items as repeated buyout offers, increasing civil penalties for harassment, and creating a rebuttable presumption for tenant harassment. We are excited to see the impacts of these work reveal themselves over time as tenants and legal service providers are just beginning to understand and fully utilize these tools in housing court. Education on these new laws is essential to their success, and we appreciate the Council's support of this goal. To, um, now, um, uh, turning to the specific bills um, that uh, we are discussing today, the first thing um, I'd like to do is really reiterate our appreciation of the Council's sustained focus and partnership on anti-harassment efforts that really have been the core of our work at HPD. Um, and with the specific bills, um, our general um, belief 
is that um, we certainly share um, the spirit and the, and the belief that the underlying goals of every piece of legislation that we are talking about today um, are um, noble, um, and we are looking forward to working with the City Council on um, the specific bills in order to make sure that they are achieving their intended purpose. Um, once an HPD violation has been issued, um, it, owners are required to correct the condition and then certify to the agency that this correction was completed. And so we take very, very seriously our responsibility to audit owner certifications, and we currently do so very aggressively. Therefore, HPD supports the Council's Intro 1279 audits of Class C certifications of correction filed with the Department. We also support giving tenants information to ensure they are better protected. Intro 1274 gives tenants more information about their rental history, and we definitely support the same. Now, in 2015, the Council took important steps to strengthen tenant protections around buyout offers at the time they are given. We would be very interested in exploring uh, other methods that could meet the Council's intent to proactively educate tenants about their rights related to buyout offers. And while we understand the intent to keep careful watch on certain property owners, in show 1242, for instance, we believe requires technology upgrades and data that HPD does not have access to from uh, the state HCR um, and might divert resources that are critically needed elsewhere. Finally, HPD has worked with Council Member Chin closely on vacate orders in her district and appreciates her partnership to ensure that landlords are addressing the conditions of their damaged or unsafe buildings to get tenants back home as soon as possible. We feel strongly that unsafe conditions must be addressed urgently to get tenants home, and this should be the focus of our efforts. We look forward to working with the council member on discussions around Intro 30 to give HPD additional and more effective tools to do this with increased speed and efficiently. Um, HPD takes the recovery of relocation expenses, just like tenant harassment, very seriously, and we're always willing to discuss best practices to ensure the best results for tenants. Um, I'd also like to mention, in particular, for Intro 1258, um, we have um, colleagues from the Department of Consumer Affairs who are here to answer questions specific um, to that piece of legislation, and that department is also submitting formal testimony. Overall, and in conclusion, um, I'd like to reiterate that the administration has made a comprehensive and concerted effort to address tenant harassment through a multi-pronged approach. HPD recognizes that as we continue to produce historic levels of affordable housing, we must also protect New Yorkers from illegal activity by landlords looking to push them out to charge higher rents and deregulate units. With extreme market pressures and strong incentives for bad actors to go down this path, a coordinated effort among different agencies and different branches of governments is more important than ever. So we thank the speaker, we thank the chair of this committee and all of the members of the city council, our advocate partners for their unrelenting commitment to promoting the rights of all tenants in the city. And we look forward to working with everyone to continue and expand our existing efforts with data-driven, targeted solutions. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, um, and I think now we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Barry Gudenchik, um, and I'll just open up with a few questions uh, related to inspection and collaboration. Uh, I'd like to first focus on DOB and HPD inspections. There have been reports that DOB and HPD would close complaints if they do not have access to a building or apartment. Why would an inspector close a complaint if they do not have access to a building or apartment? I think we've answered this question in previous testimonies, but what I'm happy to discuss it further is that we're response, we're complaint driven, and um, when our inspectors attempt to get in, they will revisit uh, at a different time of the day in a different time of the week and make a second attempt. Um, and then if that is unsuccessful, then depending on the indicia that we see that might be indicative of, the, of a violation, then we will seek to get an access warrant. So just so I'm clear, is it the 
is the DOB and HPD's policy to, upon not being able to gain entry, make an appointment to try to get back? Well, when our, whenever we attempt and we can't get in, we leave a notice ask with phone numbers and contact information and saying that we would like to get access and that we need to get access and uh, we seek to have someone reach out to us. So, uh, I'm, so I'm not really clear if there's a solid process for appointments going forward or if there's a, uh, we, we just want to get to being able to, obviously the safety issue sometimes concerned and we respect the idea that you can identify or an inspector can identify the level necessary. I, I, just, I just don't know as the chair, the, the various levels that escalate to an appointment or to uh, 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 entry that's assisted by law enforcement or what, what, what's the actual process? So Mr. Chair, so as the commission mentioned, our process is we made two, two attempts to perform that inspection. And if, the, if, the, if no access is available, the inspection, the, the complaint is closed out. If there are additional complaints, we'll go and perform additional inspections. Um, that being said, we regularly have conversations with tenants, and if tenants have the ability to provide us with access, we share information, phone numbers, we try and arrange it such that the tenant is available to allow our inspectors to actually access the building. So you, so you do consider uh, tenants an access point if necessary? Absolutely. Okay. So who at HPD is responsible for ensuring maintenance complaints result in inspections? We have um, a, the, the largest department in our, um, in the agency is the Department of, is the Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Strategies, which is led by Deputy Commissioner Anne-Marie Santiago. Um, the vast majority, actually, of our workforce is dedicated um, to this critically um, important work. Um, we have close to 300 inspectors and about 30 or 40 supervisors um, with a well-coordinated system to ensure that our enforcement of the housing maintenance code, um, which includes um, a very rigorous process for um, uh, identifying issues in units and buildings, issuing violations, following those protocols happens. And so it's within the Office of Neighborhood um, and Neighborhood Services that all of that work happens. They all report to Anne-Marie Santiago, um, and um, uh, that office now is a direct report to me, which had not been the case previously. Uh, so similarly, I, I, ask, I submit the same question to DOB. Uh, who at DOB is responsible for ensuring construction complaints in residential buildings result in inspections? Uh, our Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement, uh, Tim Hogan, oversees a variety of uh, different units that are headed by Assistant Commissioners and also our Office of the Building Marshals. So um, those, are the, those are the different uh, divisions within the uh, Office of Enforcement that um, respond to complaints. And I think I'd, if I may, um, Mr. Chair, I forgot to announce myself for the record earlier. I'm Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at Buildings. So as it relates to harassment, we have a process in place by which all of these complaints are referred to our Office of the Building Marshal. And the inspectors and investigators within that office have the experience, the expertise to handle these types of complaints. And over time, I think we've made some progress in um, prioritizing those inspections. All complaints related to harassment are now prioritized by the building's department. So depending upon the severity of that complaint, inspectors, investigators with the marshal's office will get out there either right away or say two to three days. Thank you. In the interest of time, and I know my colleagues have uh, other hearings on their dockets, I would like to open the line of questioning to my colleagues, uh, beginning with Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Torres Springer for your collaboration around the speculation watch list. Um, I'm actually, I feel like that's going to be a powerful tool for proactive code enforcement. And uh, I actually want to thank the Buildings Department. I, I, you know, as you know, I partnered with Housing Rights Initiative to publicly fault the Buildings Department for a lack of information sharing, automated information sharing between the Buildings Department and DHCR. And so I'm actually happy to see that you're gonna have a system in place that's gonna allow for, so if, 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 if there is a discrepancy between DHCR data and the Section 26 of the PW1, 
the build, build, building information system is going to halt the application? Yes, that that's correct. Okay. That's, we think that's going to launch this month. It's been, we've been doing that manually, but uh, we want to add that other layer of aut automation. So that, that's going to be happening later, later this month. And so, Council Member Torres, the, the tool of which you speak, um, that will be in place before the month is out. And as you, as you um, explained, when we receive applications, um, the, our system will automatically check with the data that we've received from H HCR to determine both the regulation and occupancy status of that building. And if the information does not reconcile, that job gets stopped in its tracks. So permits will not be issued under those circumstances. So you're going to have a system in place for halting applications? Right, and preventing the issuance of permits. But, but what about, you know, I can imagine a falsification. One case of falsification could be the product of a sincere error. But if you have an applicant who has a pattern in practice of falsifying legal instruments, which is what a building permit or an application is, even if you're stopping their application, are there going to be consequences for the falsification itself? Absolutely. So if there's a pattern, a practice of these falsifications, our building marshal's office and others within the apartment will take a broader look at that owner and their portfolio. So for example, in these types of situations, our work isn't just limited to the one particular building where this falsification, let's say, has been presented. We take a broader and more holistic look and look at the buildings with the entire, in, of the entire portfolio. And depending on what we find, there could be violations, stop work orders, um, referrals for criminal prosecution and the like, as was happened previously. So if they're going to be under my bill, if there are five cases of falsification, even one case of falsification, that would trigger an audit. What's the practice of DOB at the moment? So the practice right now is two examples would result in additional scrutiny and an audit by the department. So that provision of your bill we do support. But the, the, the part about the PAAs and five PAAs resulting in an audit, we don't think that's an appropriate indicator of harassment. PAAs are filed routinely at the Buildings Department. We get many thousands of them. And therefore, more what, what if you have an applicant with an unusually high number of PAAs, that it's just outside the norm? Yeah. Shouldn't we be examining those more closely? It depends. So like you and I can negotiate whether five is the right number, but to say we should not consider PAAs at all strikes me as... In and of itself, it may not be an appropriate indicator of harassment, but for depending on the scope of the job and the size of the job, depending on the number of documents that are filed, including PAAs, and how they're filed and what's contained in them, they may be reason to pursue further action and investigate across a particular so You agree in principle that if you have an unusually high number of PAAs, and we can negotiate what that number is or should be, then it should be subject to an audit your wider portfolio should be subject to an audit? Perhaps, yes. I think we have to discuss a little further in terms of what that looks like, but yes, perhaps. Okay. It seems to me the Buildings Department has two forms of enhanced scrutiny, right? You could either subject someone to an audit, which is a form of enhanced scrutiny, or you can strip an applicant of self-certification privileges. Like, how often do you audit the wider portfolio of an applicant? How many, do you know the exact number of cases in which you've done that? So in terms of the, the number of audits that we perform, I can tell you that it's certainly something we do quite regularly. I don't have the exact number of times in which we're auditing a particular building or a portfolio building under a, a particular- A portfolio-wide audit. Yeah, I can't tell you the exact number, but it's something we do with some regularity. But, but you would describe it as a common occurrence? I would say so, yes. And we can get back to the committee with numbers in terms of exactly what that looks like. And, and how often do you strip applicants of self-certification privileges? So as it relates to the discipline side, um, the year to date, um, there have been 22 design professionals who've, had, who've been disciplined. And that oftentimes results in the stri stripping of their professional certification privileges or their ability to file within the department in its entirety. How many applicants? There have been 22 design professionals year to date who've had their um, uh, privileges um, suspended or revoked. And what about the actual developers? Are you only faulting the design professionals? What if, what if a developer is consistently associated with falsified building permits? At what point do you hold the developer accountable? As it relates to owners and developers, many of the, the, the construction documents that are filed with us, the PW1s, will in fact result for referrals to the larger task force. So is that the, so 
if, if, okay, so you'll refer an owner to the larger task force. What about fines? Because I noticed DOB earlier in the year issued about $250,000 in fines against Kushner companies. How often do you take that kind of course of action? Um, that's sort of the, that's the standard practice. So in the sort of way things work within the building code, it's the owner of the building who has the obligation to ensure that their building is maintained in a code and zoning compliant manner. And that applies to all types of things, including um, harassment related issues as well. So violations, generally speaking, are issued to the owner. Okay. And we publish that information monthly, our enforcement efforts, uh, uh, along with the violations, a lot of violation data, a lot of of our certificate of correction, that uh, information is issued monthly. And how effective are you? And I, I guess collection is the bailiwick of the Department of Finance, but if, if an owner is chronically violating your rules, yet failing to pay their debt obligations to the city, does DOB withhold a building permit until those debts are paid? Yes, we are. So a uh, law that was act enacted in the prior tenant harassment package last year, we're in the process of implementing. And so this month, we'll begin sending revocation notices to owners who have a combined total of $25,000 or more in debt to the city. So yes, we have a practice of doing that, and we're going to begin implementing that this month. Okay, and I guess uh, what, uh, what's the trigger? What's the threshold for? Uh, $25,000 or more in debt to the city. Okay. And do, you know, do we know the number of delinquents that would affect? Uh, we can provide that information a little later this month when we complete our work. Okay. Now, I take it that DOB supports the notion of applying the audit requirement to those on the speculation watch list, is that? That is correct. Absolutely. Do you believe those on the speculation watch list should continue to enjoy self-certification privileges? I think absent anything that would indicate that they're non-complying, I think that they should. I think that uh, I think the speculation watch list is a great tool for us to do just that, watch. And if we see that there's uh, uh, improper activity, then perhaps expand our, the investigation of the portfolio. And, and I had a member of the audience ask me about extending the audit requirement, and this will be my final question, to buildings on the AEP list, um, the Alternative Enforcement Program list. I guess, how does HPD and DOB feel about applying the requirement to AEP buildings? It makes sense to me, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I mean, I think we'd be happy to discuss yeah, the issue we have with the council that. and HPD. Happy to do that. Okay. Any thoughts from HPD? Um, the, the spirit of um, closely monitoring those buildings, we already do. I mean, it's the, the basis for um, AEP, and so what we would have to um, evaluate is whether this additional step is duplicative of what we're already doing because they are in AEP. If it but, is but, but not, with respect, Commissioner, HPD is not auditing the portfolio of a property for DOB violations, right? That's a DOB function. So, so I don't I don't see why it would be duplicative. Well, that's the question to be answered, and so we'd be more than happy, Council Member, to take an extra look at that. As I, uh, when, as I began, we, we agree in spirit. We just want to make sure, and this is more of a global point for sure on all of the bills, that the implementation of each and every one of them is one that meets whatever the, un the underlying joint goal is that we have and is not duplicative of anything else that is happening. Okay, that's the extent of my questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. I just want to, for the record, uh, I refer to my colleague uh, before his questioning as Richie, I meant Council Member Torres. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we now have questions from uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera. Carlina, please, Rob. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, this is clearly a big deal. In my, you know, I have a housing background. I come from providing tenant services at a community-based organization in which you know the East Village and Lower East Side is clearly a neighborhood that has undergone a lot of change, a lot of displacement, and the horror stories from tenants on harassment and what they're going through, construction as harassment, frivolous litigation, deprivation of services, um, all very, very serious, and I know that you take your work very seriously, so I thank you for being here and testifying. So the tenant protection plans, you know, are one way or one tool that we use to make sure that residents feel safe in their own buildings, whether it's during construction or renovation, 
or or the long term tenants who know that those units are are being speculated on and every square inch and in, in, especially in Manhattan you know, wants to be built on. And so I, I heard your testimony and apologies for having to step out. There, there are hearings going on at the same time. Um, and that you support, and specifically with DOB, that you support some parts of the, of the bill, um, but not the bill in its entirety. And I'm talking about intro 1278, which, which, I, am, which I have introduced. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about tenant protection plans. Does DOB conduct random inspections when a building has a tenant protection plan? So the law now requires, the answer is yes. The law now requires the buildings department to proactively inspect, um, mul occupy multiple dwellings with tenant protection plans. So how many stop work orders were issued by DOB for buildings that did not have a tenant protection plan? And on average, how long does a stop work order last for this type of violation? I can provide you with the number of stop work orders we've issued generally. I don't have that information specific for TPPs. Um, Sal, do you have a census to like? The so we don't track it that way. I have stop, order, stop work orders. Bear with me here. Um, so I'll get I'll get you that information in just a moment. But um, so we currently. Uh, we currently perform proactive inspections, and if in the event um, a tenant protection plan has not been filed or if it's insufficient, as a matter of practice, we stop the job. So do, tenant, do, do TPPs regularly go beyond the requirements for the plans that are outlined in the building code? <clears throat> well, there's certainly... And if you could talk a little bit about what are in these plans, because for, for me and a lot of my colleagues, the complaints that we get are around, around dust and debris and, and pests, which I know can go to different agencies. All of that um, is a serious public health issue. So if you can talk a little bit about what information does DOB require and then whether they go beyond the typical requirements. So as a general matter, the TPPs are required to provide the means and methods for protecting tenants against construction. And our code provides several different criteria that needs to be achieved. Um, it includes things like structural stability, egress, health requirements. A recently acted local law expands the TPP further to capture essential services as well, heat and hot water. And so our plan examiners, when they receive one, review the TPP that's been filed against what the code requires. And recently enacted legislation requires the TPP to be provided with a greater level of specificity. Sort of the problem we had previously was a lot of these um, clever applicants we're just more or less copying and pasting language from the administrative code, which isn't helpful at all. So we now require that these TPPs provide a level of specificity that's specific to the scope of work that's happening within the building. So do you, do you support the intro 1278? I, I'm, I try to go through your, the recommendations based on intro 1107, and <clears throat> I'm just trying to figure out wholeheartedly whether you support the bill and whether what are the things that are holding you back? Are they, are they the costs that are associated with the bill? So there are, as we understand it, there are two parts to the bill. One, one part requires greater scrutiny of the tenant protection plan, and the bill outlines a number of ways in which that additional scrutiny is performed. We support that. We have that that's a wonderful idea, and we support that. There, the second portion of the bill calls for heightened inspections of the tenant protection plan. Currently, some of those provisions for heightened um, inspections we're currently meeting. So for example, when we receive a complaint concerning a tenant protection plan, we are out there performing that inspection within 72 hours as the legislation requires. However, what we think is a better approach generally than what your legislation is requiring would be to require special inspections of the tenant protection plan. So currently the department performs inspections of TPPs, not just based on complaints that we receive, but also inspections in a proactive fashion as well. And what we'd like to see happen is also, in addition to that work, to make the tenant protection plan subject to what we call special inspection, which means to have a third party who's registered, who's licensed by the buildings department, require that third party to regularly perform inspections of a tenant protection plan. So they would show up and inspect prior to the work commencing on a weekly basis throughout the duration of the construction, 
in the event they see something wrong with the tenant protection plan, that um, um, third party who's recognized by us would be required to inform us so we can go out and immediately perform inspections, issue violations, whatever action is appropriate, and that third party special inspection inspector would have to be required to perform follow-up inspections as well to make sure whatever conditions we issued a violation for would be corrected. So we think our proactive and complaint-based inspections as a department with our inspectors, coupled with these third-party special inspector inspections, will go a long way to improving the quality and enhancing that, the quality of the CPPs and ensuring that they're actually adhered to and complied with. Council Member, we issued 11,804 stop work orders last year, and uh, so far year to date, 10,153. How is that in compared to previous years? I'll have to get back to you prior to 17. I just have the data for the last two years, this year and the previous year. Sounds like an impressive number, but I it's mean, consider it, it does sound like a lot. I think, you know, with the, with the bill, um, I think what's so important is the, is the timing. So your recommendation, I'm happy to, to talk about on how we can improve, you know, my bill or any of the other council members, but the timing of, every, of everything is so important because you can make a complaint and not get the inspector out and not get a violation issued and by that time you're one week, two weeks, three weeks in. You know, you're trying to organize your building, you're getting community-based organizations involved and it's just so urgent because if you're, you know, an elderly person or you have a, a baby, you know, this dust and this debris could really, really be a serious issue. So. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in discussing how we could work together. I just, you know, the Department of Buildings, you know, historically, um, as a former tenant organizer, I know we've had our challenges. Um, so I'll, I'll take your recommendations and happy to discuss going forward. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you. So I, I'd like to identify um, uh, a particular, some particular pieces of the legislation. Uh, right now, Intro 977, a local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to mandatory sanctions for submitting incorrect professional certified applications for construction document approval. I believe that uh, Councilmember Torres may have touched on it, but um, I'd like for you to walk us through how DOB determines which applications for construction document approval are audited. So that happens in a number of ways. Um, first is through a random audit. So um, we have a target where we randomly audit 20% of these prof professionally certified um, construction applications. But it doesn't stop there. We also apply a risk model. So based on, say, for example, known bad actors, um, we'll pull out jobs that are within the, within, that are professionally certified and pull them out for auditing as well. So it's random and we also apply a risk-based approach as well. Uh, in 17 and 18, how many professional certified applications for construction document approval did DOB receive that had incorrect information? I think we're going to need to get back to you uh, in a moment or later. To so, so getting back to me, um, also, could you get back to me on, you know, what were the, what was the fallout and or repercussions for those once you've identified them? So it's a double question to get back to me on. So the number and then what were the repercussions? So in terms of the repercussions, when we um, randomly audit these professionally certified jobs or we apply our risk model and we, uh, we find problems with the filing, the first step in the process is the applicant get, gets what we call a notice of intent to revoke. And we give them a period of time to correct whatever flaws are in the, um, in the application. In the event they fail to do so or do so incorrectly, the next step in the process would be to revoke permits and issue a stop work order. And again, Councilmember Torres asked this, but I don't know if I got or understand the, the um, answer to it. Uh, are there any sanctions imposed on an applicant who's DOB who, when DOB receives the false information on an application for a building permit? Absolutely. So they, the sanctions that they can receive include having their privileges to professionally certify, suspended or revoked, and in the more egregious cases, they can have their privileges to file with the department as a whole, suspended or revoked. So if falsified by an individual, is it generally the case that such individual was working alongside others who knew of the falsification? Like, do you, do you drill down that deep, or is it just the organization and that's it? Okay. 
Salvatore Agostino for the Department of Buildings. So just to make sure I understand your question, are you asking the, um, if an individual, an architect or an engineer, or a, or a property owner? Uh, the architect or, or engineer. So one of the parts of the bill, if an architect or engineer is disciplined um, or loses their privileges, the uh, other professionals in that um, uh, organization cannot be automatically disciplined due to due process concerns. Um, they're all entitled to a hearing, and we would have to uh, prove or have evidence that other individuals, other licensed architects or engineers were also engaged or involved in either the falsification or the misconduct. So the misconduct of one cannot be attributed to another without definite evidence and proof. I think your point, though, Mr. Chairman, is uh, I don't think it's a one-person uh, offense. I, I agree with you, I, at least I think with the, where you were going with this question, is I think there's multiple parties who are very much aware of, of the plan to do something that's uh, inappropriate. And the, as Sal just mentioned, it's, uh, it's hard to uh, prove that. That's, that's our problem. And just to add to that as well, one of the things that we do is look for linkages, right? So sometimes you'll have a known bad actor who regularly works with other types of known bad, or bad actors. So for example, a design professional who regularly works with a certain type of contractor. So if we identify a particular um, design professional who's having problems, who requires discipline, all work broadens out, not just again to just all buildings within the portfolio that's being worked on, but also amongst other types of professionals who work with that particular individual. That's part of our data approach because we see some of the same names uh, uh, popping up. So we're working to refine our models to be able to make those links. If you see some type of contractor, where is the, are they with the same uh, architect? and so on. So that's, we think we're improving our ability to identify those folks, and then that's when we're doing more proactive inspections. So, so it doesn't throw me, but the, the idea that you would have seen uh, a particular architect and a particular contract to work together on previous situations, uh, to the extent that you can answer the question, would there be potentially an investigation into any dealings that they're having together uh, going forward. Yes, absolutely. And th that is a common practice and a tactic that we use when we find a contractor, architect, or property owner that are involved with a uh, group of other um, uh, entities that are involved in misconduct. We will um, open investigations on the related parties, audit their jobs, perform sweep inspections on either all their properties, all the permits that they have. That's a common tactic that the agency has used for many years. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Levine. Thank you, Chair Carnegie, and hello, Commissioners. I want to ask you about Intro 1274, which I'm pleased to be the lead sponsor of. This would require that landlords provide a rent history when two ne new tenants move in. This is so critical because of the frequency of fraud and new tenants who are not well-versed in their rights might not know to ask for that rent history and may never realize that they were being overcharged or may not realize until after the four-year window has passed. And so this bill's an attempt to, to level the playing field so every single tenant, not just those who are well-informed, has the power of this information. I, I, I gather from your remarks that, that the administration supports this bill, is that right? That's correct. Okay, that's great. Um, I have heard from advocates who, who, while supportive of this bill, worry that um, HCR is, is um, so lax in its enforcement of, uh, of, of state rules that rent histories provided to tenants could themselves uh, be inaccurate and that there are not good mechanisms to catch that and to enforce that. I realize I'm asking you about uh, state uh, policies here, but if you could comment on the extent to which you see that as a real risk. I think it's important that while we support the bill, we, um, we do confront how it gets implemented and that the, the issue of credibility of the information that's provided, 
I certainly don't want to speak for um, HCR. We, we do work collaboratively in sharing information, working on the, the, um, the joint task force, and though there, I do know there's a real commitment, um, but I do think it's important for us to work together to make sure, um, not just on the implementation of this bill, that, we, that it is something that w can be effective, um, but likely more generally, as the rent laws um, expire next year and we fight the fight together in Albany um, to make sure that we're also considering um, what it means for new laws, modified laws, to be enforced properly. Well, if, if we get our wish and we, for example, do away with vacancy fee control, the stakes for this bill, 1274, are even higher because there'll be even more cases where new tenants are moving into apartments which remain under regulation right now uh, because of giant loopholes of decontrol often <clears throat> when new tenants move in, they're in fact not under regulation anymore. So um, <clears throat> I feel that, that, that this bill is potentially even more important if we get our, our ambitious <clears throat> excuse me, reform agenda implemented. But just to, to understand correctly, um, while DHCR would be responsible, or HCR would be responsible for the integrity of the information in these histories, the provision of the histories would be overseen by the city, and that landlords who fail to provide the histories um, would be sanctioned by the city, by HPD. Is that correct? Um, not having um, looked at closely the, the, the um, language of the bill, um, that's the, that would be a topic that we'd really have to make sure that we're understanding because that, as with all of these, it's not just whether it uh, achieves the intended goal, but whether we believe there will be an enforce, the, the right enforcement mechanism. So um, the information, of course, doesn't come from HPD, it comes from HCR. We would, we would really want to understand what the repercussions are on the, on, um, for owners for not doing this and whether we do have the ability um, and capacity to enforce in a way that, that gives the bill teeth. And so I think that would be a subject of, of further conversation between us. Right, because this, the, the very tenants we're trying to help are probably also not going to get word of the passage of intro 1274 and therefore if their landlord fails to provide them this history, might not know to contact the city to report. Um, I, right. I think there is, um, between the, uh, the bills that were passed last year and stand for construction safety, uh, which we really hope and, and believe will make a difference, uh, this package of bills, and, and frankly, um, whatever comes from uh, the work we will all do together in Albany, I think there's a real need to make sure that we are continuing our joint efforts on, on educating um, renters about, all, uh, every variety of renter about their rights. One of the main goals of the new tenant anti-harassment unit at HPD, which um, we are staffing up, we announced it a few months ago, um, and we'll, we're currently hiring for all of the positions, is to make sure that as the different laws change, that we are uh, providing the sufficient information, collateral, working with the city council, um, to renters in the city, um, because it can be, um, there's, there's a lot of information, and first and foremost, um, is making sure that we are educating tenants about their rights. And so whether it's this bill or others here, I think that's also a fruitful place for us to work together to make sure that the information gets out. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the administration's support of the bill, and it's very clear that implementation here is going to be complicated but critical that we do it right, both to ensure the integrity of the information that's on these histories when they're provided to tenants, and of course, to ensure that the tenants themselves rec actually receive the histories. And um, I look forward to working with, with you uh, to hammer out those details. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, intro 1171, I'm sorry, Intro 1258, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to main mandating audits of the records of process servers. Uh, what agency reviews the records of process servers? Uh, we are joined here by Casey Adams from the Department of Consumer Affairs to help with the, uh, these questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember, DCA licenses process servers in New York City, so we would be responsible for 
um, for audits, and we do conduct audits now. Uh, the administrative code gives us that authority. Has DCA or any other agency caught a person uh, falsifying documents or lying about having served court papers? If so, how many times has this occurred, and what's the penalty for this type of action? So we do issue violations to process servers. That would include not only lying on those documents, but also failing to comply with the applicable laws and rules for service. That is one of the things that we are, that they're required to do under current laws and rules. Um, I'm gonna give you some numbers about violations. For the past two years, we've issued 177 violations for a total of 470 individual charge counts, and that covers the gamut of misconduct. As I said, sort of general noncompliance with service standards, failure to maintain records, which could indicate that the records were um, that may have evidenced some impropriety had they been kept. We can't, we don't know that for sure, but it, it could suggest that and a number of other violations like failure to um, conduct monthly reviews that are required and on the agency side to uh, put together a compliance plan to ensure that their individual process servers are in compliance as well. In addition, we have, um, when we deny a process server uh, renewal or initial license, we put that information along with the, um, with the underlying facts that gave rise to the denial on our website. So since 2014, um, we have denied five individuals and, um, and one process server agency. We've also revoked um, a, uh, a license. And the revocation, the difference there is just that the revocation occurs during the license term as opposed to when the person comes back in for renewal. Uh, so that information is available on our website so the public can look and see if the person uh, that was involved in their case was subject to discipline and, and what the nature of that discipline was. So the five individuals that you've identified who were d uh, denied, mm -hmm. uh, what were the circumstances around that denial? Were they similar? Was it, a, was a, was it an offense that's duplicative? Like, uh, the most common violations that we see are failure to, are record keeping issues. So our process servers are very uh, closely regulated in terms of the, the records they have to keep. So DCA regulations and laws require a process server to actually have a GPS device and to log any time that an attempt at service is made. And those records have to be kept in both bound uh, paper form as well as electronically. And the, and the uh, DCA can audit those records. So often what we find is that someone has failed to keep those records and uh, therefore we will issue a violation. Um, in terms of the specifics for those individuals, I can provide those denial letters which lay out everything that they did. Uh, again, those are available to the public so people can, um, if they have an issue with this individual, they will have documentation from the department laying out why that person was not found fit to hold a license from D DCA. So in having a uh, conversation with some of the governing bodies related to process servers, mm -hmm. uh, they've indicated that uh, the record keeping system is antiquated and onerous. What's your response to that? And you, you've identified uh, the process by which it takes place. For me, it seems overwhelming, but uh, that's been one of the claims on the processor server's side is that it's onerous and uh, uh, antiquated, the sure. system. I just, I wanna make clear that you're talking about uh, licensed process servers themselves have said that the systems are, yeah, so I, there is, as I said, there are two different ways that these records must be kept, both in electronic and in written form. Uh, and I think that the these systems reflect the intent of the council when these laws were passed back in 2010 to require extensive record keeping as a backstop against uh, misuse of process servers as a tool for tenant harassment. And so we are, you know, we're open to discussions with our licensees as we are in every category about how to uh, strike that balance between effective regulation and not imposing a burden that's not necessary on the regulated industry, but we think that the, um, the extensive record keeping requirements here are sort of part and parcel of the, uh, of the program as it was constructed by the council and implemented by DCA. In 2017, how many housing court respondents faced eviction based on uh, failure to appear in court? Uh, so D DCA would not be part of that information. I believe we did get information from um, our sister agency, HRA. I'll defer. 
That's right. So um, the, the information on that specific question, um, the, the court statistics show that just over half of all non-payment cases received a court date, which suggests that the remainder of those um, cases, um, the tenants do not respond. Um, and if there are more specifics, we'd be happy to work with um, our colleagues at HRA to, to dive um, deeper into that particular issue. Has uh, DC or any other agency done a review on whether papers were properly served to these respondents? So of those that I've identified or you've identified as failure to appear, did, did anyone do a deeper dive to see if that was uh, uh, based on whether or not papers were properly served? We have not done a review of the full failure to appear default decision population. I will say that we, as part of our regulation of process servers, they are required to notify DCA where a traverse hearing occurs, which is a hearing in housing court at which the sufficiency of service would be disputed. Um, in addition, we make, we, we receive complaints through a number of different channels uh, from the, the process servers themselves who are required to submit notice of those hearings. We also make available um, complaint forms for legal advocates and judicial officials to submit a notice of those hearings to us. So DCA is not the forum where de sufficiency of service for a housing court matter would be adjudicated. However, if there is a failure of sufficiency of service and that is adjudicated in the proper forum, then that process server can be subject to DCA fines, which run from $700 to $1,000 for failing to comply with the applicable laws and rules. In 2017, how many housing court cases were dismissed uh, due to improper service? Uh, we don't have that information because, again, we're not the, uh, we're not the agency where those violations would be adjudicated. Um, we can follow up with the appropriate entities and get back to you. So you may not have the answer to this question, but it's one that's um, kind of swimming around in my head. Do courts proactively review whether service was proper, or does improper service have to be raised as a defense by a respondent? I so what, what triggers? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm not a housing attorney, so I, don't, I hesitate to answer that question. Um, but I'm sure that some of the advocates here have more intimate knowledge of housing court procedures. Um, I believe that in general, the, a traverse hearing only occurs when the issue is raised um, by uh, respondent's right. attorney. So I started to yell out, is there a housing attorney in the house? But I'm sh pretty sure there is. I'm there sure all, yeah. <laughs> so, there we got so. um, Any, any more questions? So I want to thank you for your testimony this morning. We're going to hear now from some advocates. I, I do ask that if uh, the administration is able to stay. But before you leave, I am uh, 1258. Where does the administration stand on, uh, on that particular piece of legislation? And we can start with DCA. Sure. So we submitted uh, formal testimony, which you have, should have in front of you. I, I think we agree with the goal to closely regulate process servers and ensure that, in particular in housing matters, there are protections in place. We're concerned that the mechanism in this bill, the random audit mechanism, is not the most effective approach for these types of matters. Uh, and there's some information in there about why, but in general, it boils down to the fact that a random audit by an agency side attorney of records submitted to us is unlikely to un uncover impermissible behavior. There are other approaches that we think could improve information sharing between DCA and the Office of Court Administration. Um, we're happy to have discussions with the council and advocates about uh, those. Our concern with the bill is that because this is not an ideal mechanism, and it's also very, very labor intensive to do these kinds of audits, that it could potentially divert agency time and resources from places where we're more likely to find misconduct, for instance, where it's connected with the report of a traverse hearing, where it's connected with a complaint from a housing advocate or from the, the tenant themselves. And we want to make sure that our, our resources are directed at the place where it's most likely to help people. And we think it's in that area as opposed to random audits. But again, we agree with, we understand and we share the intent of the legislation. And we're happy to engage in further conversations about how it could be updated. Uh, thank you. HPD? You, we defer to DCA okay, okay. on this particular issue. DOB as well? Yeah. Correct. <laughs> well, so thank you so much for uh, your testimony. I appreciate you being here. Uh, uh, in particular, 
uh, Commissioner Chandler, who I know is uh, not feeling uh, Thank his best. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I would ask to the extent uh, that the administration can stay and hear the testimony. We don't have that many people testifying, so if you could uh, indulge me in that way, I greatly appreciate it. So we'll be calling uh, the next panel, beginning with Emily Goldstein, Mike McKee, Alec Militic, uh, Laura Heck Falela, and uh, Kat Myers. As uh, unorthodox as it may seem, I'm going to actually ask uh, Mike McKee to testify first. <laughs> Only because we uh, we still believe that chivalry. Uh, uh, I'm is, is perfectly willing to let these ladies go first. Uh, actually, um, my colleague uh, wanted to make sure that he got to hear your testimony, and he has oh, to leave. Mr. Jonai. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael McKee. I live at 233 West 21st Street in Chelsea, and I am the treasurer of the Tenants Political Action Committee. Uh, let me cut to the chase. The New York City Department of Buildings is a disgrace. There are many government agencies, local, state, and federal, that deserve criticism, but DOP stands apart. For several years, speculators have been buying rent-regulated buildings all over the city to force tenants to vacate their ho homes. Among the tactics these sharks employ, first and foremost, is gut renovation and construction as a quick way to make tenants' lives miserable. I have recent first-hand experience with this issue on my own block, trying over a two-year period to help my neighbors living with construction as harassment I came to understand just how broken the entire Department of Buildings system is and how they clearly refuse to acknowledge that their responsibility is not only to facilitate development, but to protect tenants and our housing stock from bad actors. Now, let me just say parenthetically here that I listened to some of the testimony just now, and not to sound cynical, um, I've heard this kind of thing before and you know, we're going to try to do better, et cetera. Um, and you'll pardon me for being cynical, but I've been around the block a few times. In the spring of 2014, two dumpsters appeared in front of 222 and 224 West 21st Street. Members of the Block Association wondered what was going on. A few days later, Pamela Wolf and I encountered a tenant coming out of the building and asked her about it. That is when we learned that the tenants were already going through hell. The two buildings had recently been bought by the Slate Property Group. Slate Im immediately began gut renovations. One of the first things they did was to rip up the lobby floors, making it hard for anyone to go in or out of the building. Tenants were subjected to deafening noise. I could hear it in my apartment across the street, uh, and dust for several months as well as interruptions of gas and water service, and construction accidents such as holes being punched through ceilings and walls by untrained workers, and cascading floods from the same source. A tenant was even injured when the workers were jackhammering in the hallways from flying debris. By the time we held the first meeting with tenants, members of the Block Association, and staff from the offices of various elected officials, several tenants had already vacated their apartments, including a family with an infant. And who could blame these parents, 
given the uncertainty of what toxins might be contained in the dust. Using non-professional, non-union labor, Slate's plan was to convert the family-occupied units into what can only be described as dormitories. They subdivided apartments to create four teensy bedrooms, then rented to four young roommates, all young white men, basically, just out of college and entering the job market. We met several of these new tenants who told us that Slate representatives had grossly misrepresented the condition of the building and the promised amenities, including a roof the deck that was erected without a permit and which the landlord eventually had to remove. During this long period of construction harassment, the tenants suffered from frequent loud and drunken fraternity-style parties on the illegal roof deck. People would advertise the party online, including the entrance code to gain entry to the building, and dozens of strangers would stream in and out of the building for hours. This went on for months. There was even, a, in fact, there was an accident where someone was almost killed when a piece of lumber was thrown off the, the building by some drunk guy. There was even a period of about three weeks when the workers removed the front doors of the two buildings. Any stranger could wander into the building during this time, and the residents were understandably frightened. Squatters moved into some vacant apartments. The mailboxes were removed and not replaced for several months. Tenants had to go to the post office to get their mail. One by one, the original tenants moved out. Actually, most of them moved out in the first two or three months until only two were left out of the 22 apartments that had been occupied prior to the purchase by Slate. These two heroic tenants are still there. Many of the young professionals who rented apartments in response to Slate's advertising also moved out. Now, in addition to the two original tenants, the building is populated by Google and Amazon workers and a steady parade of tourists renting apartments through Airbnb. Slate flipped the building in 2016. They owned it for basically two years. I should add something I forgot until on my way here this morning, is that Slate also sued several of the tenants uh, on trumped up charges, which they basically lost, um, including against the two tenants who are still there, and they got, we got them uh, legal representation through housing conservation coordinators, and HCC did a great job of representing these tenants. Uh, Mr. McKee, what was, the, what was the basis for the suit? There were various bases that they, uh, th actually Slate was told they're suing, or they were suing, I'm not sure if they're still suing, the people who advised them about buying the building because the people who told them to buy the building told them that none of the tenants had any tenure rights and that they could be easily evicted. Turns out that wasn't true. And then after they found this out, Slate actually started a lawsuit uh, against the advice, I don't remember who they're suing, but or who they were suing, but it's whoever advised them to buy the building that they gave them bad information because the tenants actually could not be evicted. Um, let me list the elected officials who tried to help us fight back on behalf of their constituents who lived in these two buildings. Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator Brad Hoyleman, Assembly Member Dick Gottfried, and City Council Member Corey Johnson. Over a period of several months, actually two years, we had numerous meetings with these elected officials and or their staff for a period we were meeting on a weekly basis. All these elected officials put pressure on the Department of Buildings to stop these outrages. I think it is fair to say that all the elected officials and their staff members were as frustrated with DOB as we were. The fines DOB imposed on the landlords were ignored. They didn't even slow them down. The only time we were able to get any relief from DOB was when the landlord's workers removed the fire stops in the building, at which point DOB issued a stop work order until the fire stops were restored. Now, can you imagine? I mean, the local firefighters in the, in the uh, firehouse around the corner were abs absolutely appalled and told us the tenants shouldn't even go back into the buildings until these fire stops were put back. All the other violations by the landlord went unpunished including constant illegal weekend construction. There was no way to get DOB to deal with illegal, week, illegal weekend and construction until the following Monday. So consequently, the landlord got away with this week after week after week. Some of the elected officials we worked with have also been involved over time in attempts to negotiate improvements in how DOB treats these kinds of cases. As far as I can see, these problems remain. DOB essentially gives lip service to tenant protection, 
but its practices allow massive landlord fraud, egregious harassment, inevitable displacement, and loss of our scarce affordable housing stock. I was at a fundraiser last week for Met Council on Housing, and this guy approached me and, and reminded me who he was, and it was a building in Park Slope going through construction is harassment, and they're still having the same problems. Uh, so this is a problem all over the city. Tenants PAC supports the various bills before you today that are designed to protect tenants from harassment and displacement. We support the recommendations for amendments made by the Legal Aid Society. But unless there is a change of culture at the Department of Buildings, I am not sure that any of these reforms will make a lot of difference. The failure to reform DOB is one of the biggest disappointments of the de Blasio administration. We need a sea change. Thank you very much. Thank you. I suppose it's good afternoon at this point. I am this Kat Myers Legal Aid Society. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly um, from the perspective of tenant advocates from across the city. Um, Legal Aid Society represents tenants in all five boroughs of, of New York City um, through various housing programs, including extended legal services, um, housing help program, universal access, and um, most applicable here, the Tenants' Rights Coalition. Um, and through that work, we do representation of um, affirmative litigation on behalf of tenants, particularly where they, where they are um, experiencing harassment. Um, and despite the protections that, ha that, ex that currently exist, um, rules and regulations on, on um, what it is that landlords are permitted to, to do, what we are seeing still is rampant noncompliance across the city. Uh, we spend mo uh, the majority of our time attempting to enforce um, different code regulations um, to try and stem the harassment and displacement. Um, and we find that despite all of the tools that are currently available, that landlords are, get off the hook far too often without penalty or recourse for failing to comply with the law. Uh, we have... Um, while we are in, in the context currently seeing an expanded access to legal representation in housing court, the access to representation is, not, is going to be meaningless if advocates don't have tools to use when they find themselves in court um, to try and hold landlords accountable for, the, for their behavior. We generally support all of the initiatives, all of the bills that are currently before this committee and before the council. We appreciate the attention that's being paid to the, to the issues of, of tenant displacement. Um, and we make a few recommendations, specific recommendations to particular um, bills to strengthen penalties and enforcement to ensure that we are using these tools in a way that actually effectuates a change for te the tenant population, rather than just continuing to um, make attempts while playing lip service through agencies that are continuously struggling to um, make enforcement a part of the, the priority. I'm happy to answer any specific questions you may have, and I'll let our testimony speak for itself, our written testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Laura hecht -Falella. I am a staff attorney at the Tenants' Rights Coalition at Legal Services NYC, LISNI. LISNI is the largest civil legal services provider in the United States with deep ties to the communities we serve throughout New York City. Our staff members assist more than 80,000 low-income New Yorkers each year. In particular, the Tenant Rights Coalition is at the forefront of the fight to prevent evictions, preserve affordable housing, combat harassment, and ensure that our clients' homes are safe and in good repair. Lisney welcomes the opportunity to give testimony before the New York City's Council Committee on Housing and Buildings and commends the City Council for its continuing efforts to address tenant displacement and harassment. Lisney's clients are increasingly at risk of displacement as landlords eager to raise rents engage in a variety of tactics to induce tenants to leave their apartments. These include refusing to make repairs, failing to correct Department of Building DOB vacate orders, making predatory buyout offers, illegally upcharging new rent stabilized tenants, and obtaining possession through default judgments in housing court after failing to properly notify tenants of eviction cases. Particularly at risk are those who are long-term rent-regulated tenants, often people of color, who are the bedrocks of their community. Intros 30, 975, 59, 551, 1274, and 1258 address these issues and would enhance the city's efforts to stem the tide of tenant displacement occurring across New York City. 
Many of Lisney's clients also face issues related to construction as harassment that threaten their health and safety um, for both them and their families. Examples include landlords engaging in work without a permit or beyond the scope of their permit, and landlords failing to implement adequate safeguards for construction when there are tenants living in the building. This forces tenants to live with dust, debris, vermin infestations, crazy noise, and cracks or other structural issues to their, to their apartments and buildings. Lisney shares the City Council's commitment to strengthening DOB oversight of permit applications, particularly when buildings are occupied, and strengthening existing tenant protection plan, TPP, legislation. Additionally, in our experience, one of the most effective means of overseeing the conditions of buildings in New York, in New York City are DOB and HPD violations. Ensuring tenants, particularly those without legal representation, are aware of outstanding violations and addressing the issue of false certifications, which is all too common, will make such violations more effective in improving conditions for tenants. Intro 1279 and 1247 address these issues. Thank you to the City Council for this opportunity to testify about these important issues and for its continued efforts, as reflected in these bills, to addressing tenant displacement and harassment. Also happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Goldstein. I'm the, the Director of Organizing and Advocacy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. ANHD's mission is to advance equitable, flourishing neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. We're a coalition of 100 community-based affordable housing and equitable economic development organizations throughout the five boroughs of New York City, and we use organizing, policy, advocacy, and capacity building to advance our mission. I'm here to testify in support of all of the bills presented before the committee today. ANHD and our mem members have a long-standing commitment to fighting tenant harassment and displacement. In particular, in recent years, we've worked closely with City Council to pass a range of legislation providing new tools that support advocates and council members in this fight against harassment and displacement. That includes the right to counsel, the Stand for Tenant Safety Package, and the Certificate of No Harassment Pilot Program. Uh, as well as strengthening amendments to the definition of harassment itself. We see the bills that have been proposed today as building on and adding to these longstanding efforts, um, particularly adding enforcement mechanisms, closing some of the remaining gaps and loopholes, addressing ongoing health and safety concerns, particularly as relates to construction as harassment, and providing additional transparency and information that will help tenants and advocates to understand and defend their rights. So we support the bills and we thank the council members for their continued focus on and attention to issues of tenant harassment and displacement. Um, we would like to support the, some of the specific uh, recommendations being made for adjustments by the Legal Aid Society. Um, and we have two additional specific uh, recommendations of our own um, that are detailed in my written testimony. Uh, particularly on intro 1242, um, sort of specifying disaggregation by uh, building of where the harassment findings have been across an owner's portfolio. Um, and in addition to uh, findings of rent overcharges, which are specified, providing information on fraudulent MCIs, fraudulent I IAIs, basically any other particular findings of fraud. Um, to the extent that can be made possible, we do recognize issues with uh, some of the information that's available at the state, but looking forward to hopefully some changes coming at the state level well. I um, want to encourage thinking beyond only rent overcharges. Um, the second bill we have a specific recommendation for is intro 1274, um, where again we suggest uh, specifying that the owner uh, obtain from DHCR and then provide to the city specifically the history of both legal registered rents and the history of any actually charged preferential rents um, as may be applicable. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to testify and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alec Militic. I work for Assemblyman Dick Gottfried. Uh, unfortunately, he is not here today. He's in Albany. Um, but I'm going to read a portion of his testimony. Um, by, man by many accounts, housing-based harassment in the city is rapidly increasing. Predatory landlords are subjecting their rent-regulated tenants to various types of abuse to get them to leave. This abuse includes subjecting tenants to disruptive construction while failing to observe basic health and safety codes during construction and offering inadequate compensation for buyouts. 
current law fails to adequately protect tenants' rights. Greedy or unscrupulous landlords gain additional profits at the expense of tenants, particularly low-income tenants who have few financial and legal resources to protect their rights. The current system does not provide any effective legal pressure on landlords to deal fairly with tenants. Even when the court finds building owners, the owners know that if they fail to pay, the city will not subject them to meaningful punishment, such as, planning, such as placing a lien on their building. After eight years, those fines are wiped from the city's books. Building owners routinely fraudulently secure permits from the DOB by falsely claiming that all of their, tenant, all of their units are vacant, even though tenants continue to live in their buildings and face substantial disruption during construction. Harassment is now practically a business model for the real estate industry in New York City. This harassment needs to be ended. The bill pending before the city council will help do that. Um, and of course, you can read uh, the assembly member's entire two and a half page written testimony. Thank you. Thank you all. I don't have questions, but I do have a statement. I, I want to, on behalf of this council who's demonstrated uh, a propensity to really try to tackle these affordable housing issues, really couldn't do it without you guys on the ground advocating on behalf of constituents across the city. So I, I just want to, on behalf of my colleagues and the speaker, thank you for your continued work in advocacy around affordable housing. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel, starting with Lyric Thompson, Jose Aldez, and Greg Picard. Uh, we're just going to pause for a second while everyone's getting uh, situated at the podium. Thank you. Uh, we are back. Uh, you can begin your testimony right now. Lyric, could you push the... Hello. <laughs> That's much better. Um, good afternoon. We're in the afternoon hours, are we? Yes. Good afternoon, Council. 
I would like to offer testimony with regard to filing false documents. I have a little experience with both DOB and HPD and the filing of false documents. We'll start with DOB. Now I prepared you a little packet. If you open it up, look for this. It's on the right side. When DOB writes a violation, the way that they remove said violation is based basically on the landlord's word. In, in our case, this is an example of our landlord filing a false certification. Basically, in short, what he's done was he's taken two parking spaces and chopped them up and made four spaces. Two tenants are parking together while the other space is being rented out to a car service. Now, when we realized that this was going on, we called DOB, they came out, they wrote a violation. But before it made it to ECB court, he certified that it was a correction. He's, and all he had to do to have DOB remove this violation was submit an AEU2 certificate of correction, this photo, and a statement saying, hey, I told, I told the tenant to only park one car there. You know, it's all good. Well, what happens when they don't stop renting out your space? I called, again, 311, yet after a couple visits, it seemed that he was playing whack-a-mole with the DOB guys, and so rather than waste our city resources, I called DOB and I inquired, how do I go ahead and, and provide you what you need to full certify him rather than continue to waste our city resources? Because coincidentally, the guy just happened to move the cars. It's almost as if he knew that DOB was coming out. So DOB tells me to swear out an affidavit, fill out an affidavit and submit it, and documentation, you know, evidence. So I did. I submitted five notarized statements from every tenant in my building and approximately 102 photos that demonstrate clearly on a daily basis, except coincidentally when DOB was inspecting, the violation was ongoing. Now, I kept hearing from DOB, well, that wasn't good enough, it needs to be the same two cars. Okay, the law of averages say, you know, of, of these revolving cars, they're gonna be the same two cars eventually. So bring me the photo, we'll see. During that time, I came home to find a DOB inspector in front of my building. I was so happy because, you know, they keep telling you, we gotta spy it with our eye. They don't take your videos, they don't take your evidence, they gotta spy it with our eye. So here I was with this, with this DOB inspector. And I pointed out, if you, if you look at the photo, he's right in front of a commercial, well, both vehicles are commercial vehicles. This is a violation. I asked him, I pointed it out to him. I asked him, would you write it? No, I'm here for plumbing. I tried to explain that this was a false certification and he said, yeah, he doesn't care. Now you, DOB took his word and one photo and at the bottom of this statement, this AEU2 uh, certification of correction, which is his sworn statement, it states, and I quote, false certification is a criminal misdemeanor under sections 28-2031.1 and 28-211.1 of the New York Administrative Code, punishable by up to one year imprisonment and or a fine of up to $25,000. It is also punishable with a civil penalty of up to $25,000. So that's a $50,000, you better be honest, stick. And that's why I call this photo $50,000 evaporating out of our city coffers like a fart in the wind. By the time I got the photo from DOB, which, yes, we did have the same two cars parked there, the statute of limitations was over. This developer is still renting out my parking space. DOB would be very well served, as would our city, if we had a path for the citizens to notify the city. I mean, a real path, not a, here's a bunch of hoops, jump through them like you're a trick pony. I did not appreciate waking up every morning to take a photo only to be told to go screw, it doesn't matter. We had an opportunity to let that landlord know that we take seriously in this city, lying to the city and falsely certifying repairs, but do we really? Our city coffers are bare. It's because we let stuff like this go every single day. That needs to stop. Now, on to, D on to HPD, because I have more of an issue with them than I actually do DOB. 
My first experience with filing, with filing a complaint with HPD with regard to false documents was in the summer of 2015 when I found out that my building was rent stabilized pursuant to the 421A section of the real property tax law. Our building was not registered with DHCR. The landlord had not done his legal obligation of filling out the paperwork or even registering the apartments. So there was really no way for the citizen to know that you were in a rent stabilized building. I was fortunate enough to have someone inform me that they did a partial registration. So I called the HPD's 421A office, Elaine Tribiano. It took approximately 52 calls to get to that woman. Now, this man had been receiving a tax exemption for five years without filling out any of the paperwork. I told Ms. Uh, Tribbiano that our building, they, we have a lot of issues. No one has a rent-stabilized lease. There's shared metering with regard to the common area heating that we had building-wide. The building's not finished. I mean, literally, the building was not finished. And people have been living in this building going all the way back to 2007, which removes this developer from being able to claim a pre-construction exemption. Her response was, well, prove it. Prove that the building was occupied. I had a violation from DOB that was written in 2007 with regard to the building being occupied without a certificate of occupancy. There was an HPD emergency repair of window guards. And I had a, a lease from the tenant on the second floor that clearly stated she was there since 2008. That wasn't enough for Ms. Tribbiano. She wanted leases, rent ledgers, receipts. There's no way I could get that. I informed her that the building was not completed. And again, she asked me for evidence. I said, you know, it, honestly, a lot's not done. The plans show that we have a laundry facility downstairs. It's a moldy basement. Um, some tenants don't have floors. There's a lot of uh, the... the systems that are only partially installed. And her response was, well, he's got a CFO. And I said, I don't know how he got it. And her exact response was, well, he's got a CFO, so I don't care. Yes, let that sink in. Because come to find out, fact to truth, those buildings were written off by Artan Majuko and Gordon Holder, two men that were busted in 2015 by DOI to write buildings off and offer CFOs for incomplete buildings. Yet HPD has done absolutely nothing to assist the tenants. How, how many units are in that building? They are two three-unit buildings. So um, I, I, my, my staff texts me, and what we want to do is, in addition to hearing your testimony, which is terrific, yes. actually get some resolution. Oh, I'd love some resolution. So, in fact, I've got a couple ideas. I mean, because our issue isn't just with HPD ignoring the tenants. HPD, we have found from, from uh, 2015, HPD writes and removes violations without the repairs being done. I mean, if you look at the door photos, I didn't bring you a whole bunch of them. I only brought two. So you could clearly see that this door has never been rehung, yet there are four, four violations have been written on that. HPD allowed the landlord to rip out our common area heating in defiance of the rent stabilization law. I've written Anne Marie Santiago many times, and the woman keeps quipping at me the maintenance code, which is for one or two unit buildings. Our landlord, the multiple dwelling law, provides you a choice as to whether, where to put your heating. Between the dates of October 1st and May 31st, such heat and equipment and facilities shall be sufficient to maintain a minimum temperature required by local law, rule, or ordinance in all portions of the dwelling used or occupied for living purposes. Ms. Santiago, I don't know if she's intentionally being obtuse or just daft, but is ignoring the all portions of the dwelling portion. Our developer, Sonia Lugo, chose to put heating in all portions of the dwelling. We had heating in our apartments. When we walked into the building, we had a common area heating radiator in our entrance foyer. We had a, a radiator in our hallway that was big enough to, and powerful enough to heat three floors of stairwell. Downstairs in that unfinished laundry facility, we had heating as well. We had heating in the bathroom downstairs. All of that has been ripped out and has caused other issues such as black mold, plumbing issues, um, the building's infested with rats and vermin, yet HPD continues to remove violations. The last violation they removed for roaches in my apartment was because I don't leave dead vermin on my floor. Do you? So, so here's, here's what I'd like to do. Obviously, you came to this hearing incredibly prepared, which I respect and appreciate. 
What I'd like for you to do is, my chief of staff is to the left. I want to, uh, listen, I'm mandated to do two things uh, as a public servant and as the chair of this committee. One is to hear your, your, your issue, yes. which, which you articulated uh, 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 very aptly. And the other is to get you resolution. Well, I'd very much enjoy it also, sir, if we could have an oversight hearing with regard to the standards that HPD employs. The maintenance standards don't rise to basic construction standards, nor do they meet their own renovation standards. And that is problematic. Uh, so while I, the, the, you're, you're the constituent that we love to deal with who's incredibly prepared, but I want to get resolution for the issues that are happening in your building, one with your parking spot and also with the, the health and safety violations which you've well, our 421A building has not even been completed. Where is HPD? They are currently using an excuse. When we asked them for a pathway for, say, example, base services, he claimed that he provided base services on his 421A paperwork, yet HPD refuses to give us a pathway to actually claim base services, even though their own rules state that he's legally obligated to perform it. What, they, what they're saying now is, there's litigation, we can't talk to you. Let me be very clear with, is anyone from HPD here? Anyone? I don't appreciate my civil liberties being violated like Donald Trump, okay? I don't take that, nor do I accept it. We are suing the landlord for overcharges. That has nothing to do with HPD's lack of writing violations or the fact that they remove violations without the repairs being done. I will not be silenced. I will not just shrink off into the night. And if you'd like me to be quiet, there is one way that you could do that. Clear the bad landlords list. Raise your standards. Have some standards that are coherent and, and universal. Then I might consider going away. But until that happens, I don't see it happening. I suggest you have another bowl of cream of wheat in the morning. You'll need the extra energy. Ms. Thompson, I thank, yield. You, thank, thank you so much. Um, my chief of staff will uh, address your, your personal issues, the overarching issues with HBD and with DOB will address as a committee. I'd like our common area heating reinstalled, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Your turn. Hello. I feel like her. It just doesn't appear that way. I've lived at 160, my name is Greg Pekena. I live at 160 East 48th Street for 25 years and I work from home. Uh, in the past few years, I've experienced two large sledgehammered holes two foot square, another one five foot square, two days to complete. Uh, I have a website up with pictures of some of the stuff and explanation of everything. Water leaks, the two big holes, mail tampering and theft. I thought that was a crime. Uh, when I do my work remotely for com people with computers, they send me a check. I get all my bills, but the checks were missing and I complained to the super and then to the post office, there's a loophole. Uh, when you pay the post office a fee to deliver your own mail in the building, apparently you're not bound by any postal ethics or oath. You could do whatever, the f whatever you want. <laughs> and I would go two weeks without seeing a check and then I'd examine the neighbor's mailbox who's away for four months, find my checks in there. Not only mine, other floors. And I complained. Uh, oh, and then what? Then they cut my power for two days. They, it was an accident, it's all, always an accident. My breaker is now on the fifth floor. I live on 14. Uh, um, <clears throat> I was trying to pay off my back rent, $100, $200 a month at a time. Didn't matter, they started eviction proceedings. They went down November 19th, and a representative of Silverstone, the company, landlord, took me out of court, spoke to me, looked at my list of bullet points, and said, okay, how about two months? We make your next date two months. What do you need? Wait, by bullet points, do you mean complaints? Yeah, like uh, like yeah. the partly the what I put in front of you. Okay. Uh, oh. I put up I put it all up on a website because all the things I have to explain is too much for today, and being up on a website much better. So 
She asked me, what did my apartment need? I need to get a roommate to pay my back rent. It needs to be repainted. She never told Silverstone that that was the agreement. I called up, or I emailed, I have a paper trail for everything. I emailed the facilities manager. He said, we need three days to paint your apartment. Choose the second week of December or the second week of January. So I chose the second week of December. And on Friday of the first week of December, I was emailed by somebody else in Silverstone. Those dates are no longer available. Choose something in January. In the meantime, I had stated specifically in my email, I'm ready for the 10th. My apartment has been cleared of rugs, wall hangings, drapes, curtains, and sheets over the couch and such. It made no difference. Uh, oh, <clears throat> then they come back to me. I make a joke. I say, do I have to wait for the Silverstone Wheel of Misfortune to stop on throw him a bone? So they estimated my paint job at three days. They come back to me later. Okay, choose two days. <laughs> I think that's actually a translation of throw him a bone, isn't it? A two-day paint job that takes three days is going to be a bad paint job. And it's... I'm, what's, the, what's the size of your apartment? The size of your apartment? The size? Is it one bedroom, two oh, bedroom? One bedroom. Okay. Yes, and I plan on getting a roommate and so I'm painting all the rooms except the bedroom because that's where I've stuffed everything. I put on eight gallons of white primer myself. And I scraped the walls of the paint drips that happen when sloppy work is done. So I did the first part. And it seems like they're brazenly, like, batting me around like the mice that run underneath the new floors. So, so your most recent correspondence with them has you in the pipeline for when? Well, the last lady said, choose two days, uh, second in the third week of December or January. But I thought, two people have already estimated that the paint job takes three days. And so here's what I'd like to do. So generally, we don't do in the hearings as deep a dive as we've done with both of you, but I think it's important to hear your story. What I'd like you to do is follow up with my staff so that we can advocate on your behalf individually. Anything, um, I, I think it's important for HPD and DOB to hear from actual constituents, which is why I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I wanted to hear from you as well, and I wanted it on the record what some of your concerns are. Um, but if you can just... Uh, bring your testimony to a close so I can hear the last testimony yes. and have me uh, uh, connect you with my staff to advocate individually on your behalf. Yes, sir. Uh, who's, your, who's your council member, by the way? Sorry? Who's your council member, by the way? Do you know who your council member is? Uh, no, I just That's right. forwarded the... Uh, we'll get that. Mr. Uh, Councilman Levine's offer to testify. Okay. Uh, but there is a closing statement. Please. On November 19th, the judge gave me a new date to show my progress in repaying my debt of January 29th, 2019. And so by delaying the paint job, I can't get a roommate. I can't. And I, I have a hearing problem from the other guy that was here. Two years of jackhammering because they work at home. I can't hear anymore. So, so we, we were actually advised of your hearing problem, and uh, uh, I appreciate the fact that you asked not for an accommodation, but in the future, if there's accommodation necessary for your hearing problems, we can accommodate that. I but can I understood hear men. You, you. Okay. It's women's soft voices, or well, that other guy at the end. I didn't hear anything he said. Well, that's the opposite of me, so I don't have a woman's soft voice, so I'm glad that you were able yeah. to indulge me. I've never been accused of a woman's soft voice, but uh, uh, I'd like for now 
uh, you to just connect with my staff at the end of the hearing so that we could advocate on your behalf. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Thompson. Thank you so much for your testimony as well. Yes, you can go. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you very much, the chair. It's an honor to be, <coughs> excuse me, testifying for the first time in the city council. And uh, my name is Jose Aldaz. I am a tenant at 860 Riverside Drive, apartment 2 double E, um, New York, New York 10032. I belong to the 7th District. My council member is uh, Mr. Mark Levine. And uh, I especially wanted to support his uh, intro number 1274. And I think uh, is uh, a, an excellent initiative. I could have benefited from this when I moved at my present uh, apartment, which has been a home for me for the past 34 years. I have a rent stabilized apartment. I also receive uh, SCRI uh, assistance. I uh, receive also SSI, uh, Social Security uh, Assistance for Disability. And uh, I had about six years ago a catastrophic illness that had me hospitalized for three months and uh, then more months of rehabilitation. The landlord was a bit aware because I notified them through a representative because I was too ill to, uh, to talk or to, to move, etc. And um, my bills were paid, the rent, everything was covered uh, on time. But uh, the landlord tried to evict me 25 years ago, lacking uh, evidence but accusing me. I was using the space as a second home, which was not true, and did not give me, um, what should I say, enough of a window in time-wise to seek legal representation nor did I have the funds to retain an attorney. But I did go to court because I had no choice without an attorney. And uh, I was very grateful, as I always am, to our elected officials and all professional persons in government because they can hear without saying a word uh, observing the people, the judge called me personally uh, to have a private word before the case began. And he sensed that I might not be uh, trusting the process or the, the court. And I said, no, Your Honor, it's the contrary. I'm terrified because I'm here without legal representation. And I know what I'm up against. And the uh, accusation is not true. But I don't know how to defend myself on legal terms, etc. So uh, I won the case. Uh, the, accusations were unfounded because I, my profession is I'm a, a classical pianist, I travel, etc. but I was doing a residence, a, a job that kept me uh, away from my home Monday through Friday, but I would be uh, home in my apartment uh, on weekends. But Somehow, my absence, you know, I thought, are these people spying on me when I'm not in and so on? Okay, that's a long time ago, but um, 
the recent situation we know citywide is a lot more critical. And I am in that, that area of Manhattan that just went through a, a rent uh, regulation, uh, rezoning Washington Heights. And um, the landlords who are uh, not the best, you know, they want to push people out uh, for monetary reasons. And my landlord owns many buildings in the city. I really don't know how large his holdings are, but my building is one of many that uh, belong to that company. And lately, the um, harassment has increased. They've never painted any in 25 years. Uh, there are leaks from the floors above in many apartments. And my um, downstairs neighbor complained that he was getting water from my bathroom, but he didn't know my ceiling in the bathroom of my apartment had come down from leaks above, and I had been living with the holes on the, in the ceiling for two years, and holes on the floor also drilled by repairs that were never finished. So sure, he would be getting, because the floors above are not fixed. So um, recently, he uh, restored his apartment, so he was very upset with this damage to his newly renovated space. So he sued the landlord, and the landlord demanded that any time he needs access to my, my apartment, I have to provide it on the spot, or else uh, he would initiate uh, legal proceedings against me for whatever charges that uh, he would um, come up with. For three years, uh, I had heart, uh, op open heart surgery f four uh, years ago. Right after I was home discharged, uh, that was a another illness from the first catastrophic one. I was uh, trying to recover and, uh, at home, and there was uh, music being played so loudly that the walls shook on my uh, floor, and in every room the same vibrations for the uh, atrocious uh, noise of uh, Stereo, uh, stereophonic music at three, four, five in the morning. Sometimes it would go for 24 hours nonstop. Many responses from the city police came uh, when I called to, to complain for the noise, and that never stopped for about three years until a police officer, I think, he felt sorry for me. There was no room for, to fix that problem. So the officer told me that they would continue to respond to my complaints to, for the uh, excessive noise, but that it was up to the landlord. And that's why that was continuing. And sure enough, I addressed that, so that noise stopped. But then uh, the heating uh, in the winter is so hot. Now, first there was lack of heat, now excessive, that uh, in cold weather outside, it, in the apartment, in the bedroom, 90 degrees. I 
measure the you know uh, temperature called 311 this happened often you know throughout the winter that the heat would be always uh, for days 90 plus and 311 could not take that complaint saying people call to complain for lack of of healing so we don't accept if you have heat you you should be grateful i said but when it is detrimental to one's health and uh, it, it is also condu uh, conducive to infections from contamination if especially i have leaks and i have all kinds of uh, and very dangerous health issues caused by the neglect in the apartment. And so uh, anyway, uh, the escalation of these problems, uh, with the landlord uh, pressuring that now I envision, they told me that they would initiate legal action uh, with me if I did not do what they requested, like access immediately or I don't know what else. They were saying that any more damage to the apartment below me, then I would have to pay for. And so uh, it is uh, at a point that your initiatives uh, and together with the mayor's office initiatives that protect tenants like us and like many millions of people in the city, we commend you for the initiative and urge you to please uh, be uh, more thorough as to how they can, uh, situations of constant abuse can be deterred and uh, I don't know if a network of information between uh, some agent, uh, uh, you know, uh, tenant associations or some, some way to channel this to you so that these abuses cannot uh, be uh, perpetrated uh, until people finally uh, move out or die from some disease because uh, we have no more recourse. Well, I want to thank you for your testimony. Um, your particular council member, uh, Mark Levine, has been at the forefront yes, of right. legislation, uh, especially around representation yes. uh, in the court system. So you benefit from that. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. From Mark working really hard to make sure that that happened. I'm glad that you came. Uh, to testify today again so that uh, the agency can put a face mm -hmm. uh, and a name to some of the atrocities that are happening. Um, it's uh, for all of us. We are here for uh, a reason similar and uh, people who does disagree with what uh, some of the uh, laws consider, uh, being considered, that's not I think most of us are here because we want to support your initiatives to deal with these problems, and I'm one of them, and I commend you and thank you so much. Well, I, again, I thank you for your testimony. I do have a personal question to ask you. Are you still uh, able to perform as a classical pianist? Fortunately, I, I think I must have nine lives <laughs> because I, I still can play. And uh, one thing, this is an anecdote now, and it's perhaps fun to, to tell you how difficult it can be for a musician. I have a piano, a grand piano, which is uh, costly, and it doesn't belong to me because it was donated as a loan by a friend of mine who's a, a dear, person, a retired uh, educator who couldn't stand the thought that I had no piano because I 
lost everything financially, no more piano. He sent that piano to my apartment. He said as a loan, but it was really a gift. And it's a costly piano, around $50,000 or so. And my dear friend passed away two years ago. Uh, the landlord, in his quest to really get me out of there with that heat below, uh, above, above 90 degrees, one day there was a bang in the living room. I have a one bedroom apartment. I was in the other room and I thought something had exploded. Uh, I went to the kitchen. So it was the piano, the soundboard just exploded because it's very uh, fine wood that gives the instrument a resonance. So I cannot use it anymore until I have it sent out uh, to be restored and that's about $15,000 repair. So I go to a church that allows me the use of a piano one day a week, six hours, three in the morning and three in the evening. I am a Stanway artist. I'm on the roster as an exclusive Stanway artist, but I don't have a piano that I can call my own. And was, so, was the donation a Steinway as well? No, it's not. Uh, it, it's, uh, the piano I have is not a Steinway, but it's a, a European-made piano, a German piano. But the one in the church is a Steinway. So I just played uh, on December 2nd, just recently, that church, which is a sanctuary church, uh, at, 179th Street in uh, Fort Washington, the entrance of the George Washington Bridge in that area. The uh, church celebrated 125 years uh, since it was built. And I was asked by the pastor to play at the uh, gala celebration it was not a gala, it was a mass. It was, I asked him if I should play because I didn't call my participation perhaps religious music. And he requested one piece by Franz Liszt, which is the Liberstrom, uh, one of his most uh, famous pieces. I had to learn it because I never played it, basically because everybody plays it, I thought, why me? You know, everyone plays it much better than I. So I had to learn it for this, and I played it December 2nd. And if the audience, the congregation applauded. So they interrupted the mass and did I with my music. And so I played successfully. And uh, I am trying to retake my career after the heart operation. If I can fix that piano or find a way to practice on a daily basis, I can get back into performing. Well, that thank you so much for your testimony. And um, thank you. my hope is that you'll get back and get your chops back. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate your, all of your testimony. Um, oh, we have another. Uh, we'll call the last panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gail Kagan, Reggie Thomas, and uh, Jerry Cav Thank you. You can begin your testimony.
Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Kravitsky, and I'm here today to speak to uh, intro 1258 regarding process servers. I'm general counsel to PM Legal, um, a D <laughs> nice to meet you, Gail. Uh, a DCA licensed process serving agency with offices in Manhattan, Queens, and Nassau County. We distribute hundreds of papers each day to independent licensed process servers for service in New York City. It's been more than seven years since the initial implementation of the DCA rules regulating our industry. During this time, not, much, not many significant changes have been made to these rules, either by the agency or this council. I believe this bill would be the first significant change. We also believe that we are one of the few process-serving agencies who initially saw regulation as a positive for our industry and for the public. Um, we are also one of the few process-serving agencies who maintain a full-time director of compliance and staff to ensure our servers are properly monitored and internally audited to achieve and maintain DCA and other regulatory compliance. We think we understand the intention behind this proposed bill, undoubtedly motivated by the frustration that litigating tenants have trying to obtain useful and necessary information from the DCA. We too experience that frustration from time to time with regard to the disciplinary history of the process servers who serve for us. But we do have specific questions and concerns regarding the proposed language in the bill, which we are happy to submit in writing in the interest of time. Um, we also encourage this committee to solicit additional comment from leading industry members and attorneys who actually practice in the courts as to what works and what doesn't, and to fashion these changes accordingly. Um, we hope the time for written comment has not expired, and I thank you very much for the opportunity today. Uh, thank you, but you, you, should, you should know that part of the process in and around legislation are these hearings, so we can actually hear both sides. There's actually a real true intention, it, it, uh, so um, you can count on uh, getting feedback from us, and I would count on your feedback as well. Which is why I wanted to go on the record today. Thank you, sir. My name is Gail Kagan. I am a past president of the New York State Professional Process Service Association, and I'm the current legislative chair of that association. I am the one who's involved in anything that has to do with process service laws. I'm the one who oversees and advocates for the process server. We oppose this, this amendment as it's written, 1258, because we believe that currently New York City has the strictest laws in the nation for process service. And we're not against the laws that we have. I mean, we would like to become more attuned with technology as it changes. <coughs> if you just look at your UPS guy, runs around with a handheld, and uh, FedEx has a handheld. We also have the burden of this handwritten log, which is really a transcription. And so in that aspect, that's the, really the only thing that we don't like about the laws because the electronic record keeping is a very transparent way for not only the process service, I'll explain exactly, but it's a transparent way to, for the process service to show us that they've done the process. We've got a GPS location, we know they've been there. We've got a photograph with a GPS location on it showing us the facade of the building. Then they, um, they electronically record, they, they type into their phone, basically, what they did, who they spoke to, what happened, and they send that to a person that they have contracted with who maintains these records separate and independent from the agency and separate and independent from the process server, which means that they're tamper-proof. And that company maintains those records. This is great stuff. This is wonderful stuff. And as technology changes, we're hoping that we can stay abreast of whatever new changes, blockchain technology, all this stuff is going to come into play in, in terms of record keeping. And, and we want to be on the forefront of that so that we can stay relevant. But back to my advocacy of, of process service, I, I'm under, I understand because I, I work on the border of Westchester and the Bronx. That's where I maintain my office and, and I serve process and, my, and the people that work with me serve process. I work with legal services of Hudson Valley. I work with em Empire Justice Centers. I work with various um, advocates. And in the course of my day, they send to me documents 
of proposed orders to show cause that tenants who come to them have them fill out. And sometimes they just come straight to me to get these documents filled out. And they tell me, I'm, the story is there. I paid this rent. The social services paid this rent for me. I had the receipt, but the landlord's refusing to allow that. I mean, I get this every day. I, dozens of cases come across my desk. And I'm just notarizing, so they have to tell me their story. The, the ceiling's leaking. You know, uh, the, the, there's a hole in, in my floor. The air condition is leaking. I withheld my rent. Now, and then I got laid off, so I need more time. And these are order, proposed orders to show cause to the, to the judges. And I get to hear these stories on, on a weekly and daily basis. So I'm fully sympathetic. And on top of that, my process service, the process service that I'm representing, and they're not necessarily members of NIPSA. Let me be right out there. Not every process service is a member of my organization. But these process services make from 10 to $17 a paper on the average, okay? They're making $30,000 a year, $40,000 a year. A really busy processor may make $50,000 a year. They live in Upper Manhattan. They live in Lower Manhattan, the East Side, the West Side, the Bronx. They live in Long Island City. They live in Queens, they live in Bed-Stuy, they live in Brooklyn. They're the very people who are in the midst of this housing crisis. They're being pushed out of their homes. So they're the same people. So they also understand what's going on. But their job, and the job and the role of the process server is to be the impartial person between two people in the litigation. They don't take the side of the landlord, and they don't take the side of the tenant. It's their job to see that notice is given. And how do they do that? They do that by following the rules of the state of New York and the civil codes of the city of New York, which means that they in a landlord-tenant case, because that's what we're talking about, they go to an address, they stop outside the address, they take a photograph of the building, they go inside, they check if the name of the person is on the door, is on the buzzer, but I understand again in landlord-tenant cases, because the landlord is giving you the paper or it's coming from an attorney, from a landlord, most people have to assume that the person is in the building. I mean, but they still will check, make sure they've got the right apartment number. Because mistakes happen, typos happen. So they check it out, they go up to the building, they knock on the door. If somebody answers the door, great. They say, hi, I'm a process server, my name is Joe, here's the paper, um, the landlord is reminding you that you have to pay the rent, make sure you deal with this, are you in the military, and, uh, or is the person I'm serving in the military? Usually when you serve a landlord tenant case, you're not only serving John Smith, but you're saying, you, let's say his name is Jose Ferrer, okay? For lack of a better name, sorry, Jose. Um, but he's serving Jose Ferrer. He's usually also serving John Doe, Jane Doe, who might live with Jose Ferrer, just to cover all the bases. So he's serving three people in that, in that unit, or in that building, or in that apartment, or in that house. Wait, wait let me ask you. So, so what you've articulated to me before the hearing and during the hearing is that there is a, a quite extensive mechanism in place Right. I guess my question would be, that's it's there. Um, it's it. Why why and why why are you so opposed to uh, a random audit? Because that's what the legislation speaks about. It doesn't it doesn't add anything else except okay, for so the ability to audit the records right. so that we can protect both parties, process servers as well as respondents. Right. Me, so let, let in, in a good case, it could clearly demonstrate that the person who is claiming uh, n lack of service is, is incorrect or is, is, is not telling the I'll truth, which ultimately protects the process server. I, I can address that. And, and in fact, I think um, the gentleman from the DCA, Adam, he, he kind of explained this too. The audits don't, the audits that, they, that the DCA does, does not look at whether the service was good. They're looking at the record keeping aspect of the service. The service could have been fine, but if, if, if in that log book, which you have, if, if you look at the packet I sent you, that log book looks like this. The, this. This is their electronic record, which comes up on their computer. They transcribe this at the end of the day into this. And there's 32 fields of information, bunch of numbers, there's bound to be mistakes in this logbook, and this is where the fines come, and this is where the violations come. 
So when DCA says you failed your audit and you owe us $5,000 because there's five errors where you left out a zip code, or you see this tiny thing that says female white, BLK, black, uh, 25, 5 and 5, 125, it's a, it's a subjective description. But maybe because it's so tiny, and this is what, this is the space he has to write in. Maybe he got, his daughter came by and he left out the last thing, the, the weight. That's a $500 fine. Okay? And this has got no, nothing to do with whether he served the process. This is whether he served the process. This has a, a photograph and a GPS location a photograph that shows the date and time and a GPS location showing that he was actually there. That's, this is what shows the actual service. But he gets audited and this is, they don't say he didn't go to the address, they say it was a record keeping error. And Mr. Adams said we find them in record keeping Adams. They don't know, the DCA doesn't, the DCA doesn't know how to serve process. They don't, they're not a good judge of whether the process is, was served correctly. A Travis hearing is to determine whether the service was good. So what I committed to you earlier was that we and your organization sit, should sit down. I mean, uh, the, re the reason being be is that I'm not committed to being right, I'm committed to getting this right. Exactly. So uh, we can, we'll and have further we dialogue. Can do to we'll make it more transparent. Absolutely, thank the you. Other thing I, the other point I wanna make is, and it's come up over and over again, the person who's making the money in this, in this situation is the landlord. The process server doesn't know if the paper he's serving is a fair paper. That's not his purview. It's the court's purview to decide the merits of a case. The process server can only serve the notice to make sure that nobody's stealing this guy's property. And then finally about Travis hearings, attorneys like to win. I mean, I work with attorneys all the time. And they like to win, that's the nature of the beast. So lots of times an attorney will call a Travis hearing to stall for time to change the dynamics of a case. He's gonna, just like the landlord is gonna do, he's gonna throw some stuff out there and find out if it sticks. If a, 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 a process server can lose a Travis hearing because he can't say, you know, what time he, he notarized the, the, the affidavit. I mean, they can read through the affidavit and say, well, it says that you notarized this on the 25th. If the process server hems and haws, his credibility is shot. If you publishize the audits on record keeping, his credibility is shot. And you talk about, and I'm sorry, I'm passionate about this guy, so forgive me for, for you know, being so adamant. But when a landlord goes to court, he's got an attorney, right? And we're trying to make tenants have attorneys. And I believe that, I, I'm all for that. But when the process go, server goes to court, he has no attorney. He doesn't get to say, um, when they ask him a question, yeah, I did that, but, he doesn't get to say but. He gets to answer the question, and that's it. He stands alone. He doesn't have an attorney. He's got no representation. It's his credibility that's being judged. His memory of a process that he could have done months ago so, 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 so with all due respect to the process as it relates to process service, I think, I think one of the um, reasonable expectations is as a licensed uh, entity in the city, there's a greater burden that's, that's uh, upon that. Absolutely. So again, um, having heard you, I definitely want to hear some more sure. and get to a place where we can get this right, both right. for the process server, which I understand in my former capacity as chair of small business is a small business. And we don't want the city to be onerous on small businesses, right? But we do want to make sure that um, uh, tenants have an opportunity to get the correct service and are not being forced out of their homes for, for bad, poor, misleading service. And that was the intent of the bill. Um, I'd like to continue to have a dialogue to get to the intent mm -hmm. and protect uh, the tenants' rights in service, mm -hmm. but also protect uh, those small businesses that represent themselves through process serving. So you have my commitment to that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cornegie. My name is uh, Reggie Thomas. I'm Senior Vice President at the Real Estate Board of New York. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity. This is my first time testifying before the committee in my relatively new capacity, so uh, looking forward to hopefully uh, more future appearances. Um, as you know, Rebney is a broadly based trade association. Did, did you just say featured appearances? In future, future. Oh, no. Okay. I, if there's future, then I probably shouldn't be here. Okay. Future, to be clear. <laughs> as you know, Rebney is a broadly based trade association representing owners, developers, brokers, managers, and real estate professionals active throughout New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and to provide support and constructive, co constructive comments on the bills being considered this afternoon. Um, first, at the outset, let me emphatically state that the Real Estate Board in New York stands with public officials, advocates, and other stakeholders in finding sensible policy measures to root out bad landlords and to protect tenants from deceitful actions. We have an affordability crisis in New York City, and illegal measures taken by unscrupulous landlords should be met with full punishment allowed by the law and with supportive enforcement efforts to do so. We also want to applaud the Council for considering a wide array of legislation. As written, many of the bills being considered seek to target fraudulent information submitted as part of permit and certificate of correction apps, add additional requirements for tenant protection plans, and add new requirements to increase transparency for tenants occupying buildings undergoing construction. Today, we want to provide support for many of the bills, as well as additional feedback, including ways that legislative language could be either strengthened or clarified. Uh, bills such as intros 551 and 1242 make attempts to increase transparency both for public consumption and to help make data-driven policy decisions, which Rebney absolutely unequivocally supports. We fully support intro 1242 to expand the available data in the online property owner registry, but do want to caution that while we support the intent of intro 551, which is to help get better data on the universe of buyout agreements, the types of information being asked for would likely lead to false or an incomplete data set illustrating the nuances of a buyout agreement. Legislation such as Intro 1258, sponsored by you, um, which will require an audit process to, place, uh, to be placed by DCA to ensure that tenants are properly served with eviction notices of a court proceeding is generally supported by the Real Estate Board. Um, as some of the other panelists have described, there is a process in place for, um, uh, for making sure that there's non-tampering measures, but to the extent that process servers are still going around this process, improperly serving um, tenants, engaging in sewer service, that's unacceptable. If evictions happen for a wide array of reasons, there are sometimes tenants who are engaged in illicit or illegal behavior, are disruptive, and this is just a normal course of a city of eight and a half million people. There will just normally be evictions. But tenants do have the right to be served properly to make sure they know the date of their court proceeding, period. No, nothing further than that. And to the extent that we can be helpful in providing information about this or be helpful in moving forward on this bill, we're happy to provide any information that might be needed. Um, notwithstanding a number of recommended changes, we also support some of the council efforts to generally conduct audits of submissions and corrections given to city agencies such as Intro 1171 and 1279. Intro 1171 would, among many important provisions, require that DOB conduct inspections of building portfolios or the HPD speculation watch list and make referrals where false statements are made. We do recommend that for any legislation requiring audits, that they realistically be met with agency resources and that some level of discretion is included to take into account instances where it is clear that a trivial error was made and to withhold audits of the speculation watch list as it's still early in its inception with further refinements needed to the recent HPD methodology. This will ensure that the limited resources used by agencies and enforcement officials are actually used for appropriate cases and not being used for a one-size-fits-all process. Um, we also support the council's efforts to target buildings where there are a number of, uh, where there are an excessive number of violations, such as intro 975, where building permits would be denied. We appreciate that the council is thinking ahead to include exceptions where the permit needs to be issued to perform necessary work to correct dangerous conditions. We do recommend that the council consider other extenuating circumstances where a building permit should be issued, such as rehab projects that might already have a number of violations when ownership changes. While we fully support the goals of many of the bills in this package, as stated, we do have concerns regarding the practical realities, operational difficulties, one-size-fits-all approach, or level of punitive measures being taken in some of the bills. We think there are practical challenges to requiring additional layers of compliance from an owner or contractor. Increasing regulatory burdens make it exceedingly difficult to perform necessary renovations and improve building quality for all tenants. Specifically, intros 1277 and 1280, we do have concerns regarding the delays that may be issued to projects for being caught up in an across-the-board audit process or the level of fines for what may be a genuine mistake. We do look forward to working with the council to find other alternatives to meet the policy goals of these bills and exploring ways to improve these bills to target truly bad actors. 
It ensured 1278, which would ensure that DOB does additional TPP review for air and fire compliance. We are a bit concerned that this may make it harder for applicants to complete the TPP, and um, there is a risk for potential compliance issues. We would enjoy the opportunity to work with the council further to ensure that city government helps applicants better comply with TPPs through standardized reviews. Lastly, in an environment of mistrust towards landlords and governments alike, Increasing preemptive inspections, notices, and requests for information from tenants may push a law-abiding abiding landlord into a tightrope walk between compliance and harassment and privacy concerns. As an example, it's overly burdensome to grant DOB unfettered access as a condition of retaining a permit, especially in cases where a tenant refuses access, as in pro proposed in intro 1257. We recommend including noticing requirement in 1279 to tenants and landlords that their unit or building may be selected for an audit and that a visual inspection may be required. This is also an opportunity for city agencies to provide helplines and general information on building quality standards to tenants when they have that interaction. Additionally, beyond the legislative discussion today, the city needs to allocate appropriate resources and ensure there's proper agency coordination on the city and state level if we are to see improvements in enforcement, and something that we largely agree from the tenor of uh, the prior panel's uh, discussion. According to research recently published by the Regional Planning Association, a handful of landlords are responsible for a disproportionate amount of the city's poor housing and eviction cases. RP estimated that of the 750,000 plus buildings with residential units in New York City, less than 2% are actually managed by bad landlords. It's our hope that as we move forward through the legislative process, efficient and accurate mechanisms can be put in place that enable government to truly target and eradicate bad actors. Uh, as for the rest of the testimony, I'll submit that for the record to save time, but um, Chair Cornegate, your staff has been great in terms of helping us understand the bills and the intent of the bills prior to the hearing, and we hope that Rebney can remain a strong partner of the council as we move forward in this process. Thank you for your testimony, and congratulations on your new role. I thought you were going to say condolences, so thank you. <laughs> That's it. Thank you guys for your testimony, and I look forward to working with you on future legislation. Thank you. Nice to meet you again. This hearing is officially adjourned. <laughs>